I'm here, madam. Right, I shall carry on. <coughs> Can everybody hear me and see me? Uh, my name is Roshan Barrett. I'm a Chartered Town Planner and I've been appointed by the Secretary of State to hold this inquiry. The inquiry relates to an appeal submitted by GHL, Eagle Wharf Road Limited, against the decision of the London Borough of Hackney Council for development described as, and I shall read out that description, partial demolition of existing buildings, retention of three-storey building and formal industrial chimney and redevelopment of the site to provide a mixed-use scheme comprising blocks of two to seven storeys and accommodating 5,591 square metres of commercial floor space at basement ground first, second, third, fourth, fifth uh, floor level, 50 residential units at part first, part second, third, fourth, fifth and sixth floors, as well as 127 square metres of cafe floor space at ground floor level, landscape, communal gardens, pedestrian link route to Regent's Canal and other associated works. Now that was a little bit of a uh, 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 a potted um, version of the description of development, but I just left out the use classes, etc. Uh, that uh, development is proposed to, to take place at 49 to 50 Eagle Wolf Road, Hackney, N1 7ED. Now, as you know, and I've said, sorry. that description of yeah. development has been taken from the council's decision notice, and that has been agreed by all parties back in, I think it was November 22. Mom, so sorry. we've had a number of adjournments during the inquiry for exceptional and unavoidable reasons. I, I think we've now got the end in sight. However, just before that, I want to check. I, I noticed that Mr Beard isn't. Thank you, Mum. Yes, oh. um, I did speak. Uh, could I turn to the council, please? Could, could you update me, please? I can see uh, uh, Ms Stevenson there, please. Could you update me? Um, Mark Bird will be joining us shortly. I'm sorry, Ms Stevenson, I can't hear you. Um, I, I could hear Ms Stevenson. Can you hear any of us? Can it, can everyone hear me? We, we, no, madam, we, yes. we can hear yes, you. I can, uh, I can see Mr. Can, White nodding and Mr. Harwood yeah, nodding. You yeah, can hear mad, me. But, but, mad, so, madam, can you hear us? I think, Miss Stevenson, that what what I found before, if you leave the meeting and then connect your microphone um, and your camera before entering the meeting, but uh, that that's what I found has has worked. Okay, I'll try that again. But I believe everybody else can hear me yeah we we cannot hear you okay i'll i'll look yeah, so out look back no, in again. No. so i think so i think i i think what mr white's indicating is uh, Ms. Stevenson, is that we, we we can hear you but i don't know if the inspector can hear anybody mm. ah she the inspector's left the meeting <laughs> yeah i think i think there's better some Either the speaker was not working, that's why she couldn't hear anyone. But I think I can hear okay. I can hear Sasha and I can hear you, Richard, as well. That's great. Thanks, Sandy. Um, is it easiest if we all just stay in the meeting? Yeah, that's yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Sandy, can you just confirm that you can hear me as well? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I see it loud and clear. Thank you yeah. very much. Okay, so then I'll is, stay is in Mark, the meeting. Is Mark joining us? Are the inspectors back? Yes, Mark will I had a pre meeting with Mark this good morning. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Madam. Can you hear us? Ma 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 Madam, can you hear us? <laughs> Did anybody hit? Could, could, was the microphone working for any of it? Ma Ma Madam, we, we, we could hear you very clearly. Um, I don't know if you could hear any of us because no, Mr. Mr. White were trying to indicate that Mr. Beard wasn't in the meeting. Uh, Inspe I don't think the inspector can hear us still, unfortunately. Sandy, um, would you be think able it needs to another sign. Uh, do a, a pre-run with the inspector? Um, <laughs> um, I think it's to do with her speaker. Um, that might be the issue. Um, can you hear me now? We can hear you all right. Um, let me message. Uh, can, can, 
Hold on a second, I'm just see if I can turn the message on. Okay, in the can interim, I'm going to try and call Mark Baird and uh, find out where he is, the only, okay? The, can people hear me now? Yeah, the we, only we, way that, um, that the time being heard is by pressing the microphone continually, which, which is just a pain throughout. Just dropped out again. Uh, yeah, I think her mic, um, her speaker is not working, so probably she needs to turn up the um, volume on the on the computer to hear because um, I don't think it's a major issue. I think it's just the volume is turned down. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, madam. Good morning. Can you hear us? <laughs> thank you so much. Um, where did you? Thank you very much, um, Sandy. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm yeah. I'm so sorry. I I didn't realise that uh, all the tech wasn't working. Where did we get to? And we heard your introductory comments, ma'am. But what we were then moving on to you obviously couldn't hear anything but unfortunately mr beard has not joined miss stevenson said she was in communication with him and was just checking where he is oh, uh right um okay um have we got a time scale on that right well in in that case um Let me just uh, 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 set the scene. Then um, it might be that that he 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 will join in in a little bit. So um, I mean, the the purpose of today is obviously to take closing submissions. I've already heard all the evidence. I'm not I'm not anticipating any new evidence at all. Well, without Mr. Beard here, I mean, but the the two advocates. Mm. Oh, here's Mr. Beard. Up. Uh, Good morning, Mr. Bid. Can you turn your micro uh, your microphone on? Okay, I've, I've done my opening, uh, Mr. Bid. Um, I, I've just said that um, today I, I'm resuming the inquiry to hear the party's closing submissions. I've already heard all the evidence. I am not anticipating any new evidence. Could I just check with everyone? Is that everybody's? I'm looking to the three advocates. Is that everybody's understanding? Yes, I'm getting nods from all three advocates. OK, just a few protocol points uh, for virtual sessions. Advocates, cameras on, please. Everybody else, mute and cameras off. Can everybody please switch anything that's going to make a noise? Uh, mobile phones, computers or whatever. Can you please switch them to silence? If the connection drops or if there are other tech problems, we've already had some this morning, um, please can you just make me aware of it in some sort of way? Mr. White held up a, a, a notice, you know, just, just uh, 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 make sure that I know. Um, so I, I've had uh, previously, I've had time estimates um, from each party on their closing. Now, those are cancel an hour, rule six, up to one and a half hours. Is that? Still right, Mr. Harwood? Should be comfortably within that. Okay. Uh, Mr. Beard, one hour? Is, uh, is no, that... that's in about 45 minutes, madam. 45 minutes. Okay. About one hour. Uh, what, what, so, and, and then, Mr. White, I've got an hour and a half? Yes, I think that's about right. Okay. Um, Mum, yeah, we're 34 pages, so I think two minutes a page roughly, so yeah, about an hour and a half. Okay, now what I would ask, please can you send, Mr Beard, could you please send your closing through 
to the case officer just so I just like to have a hard copy in front of me and I, I you know as I as I listen and uh, I'll, I'll uh, make some notes and can each party do that thank you very much Mr Harwood I already have yours uh, um, mum can I make a point that I made to you last time I, I obviously have the right to reply to Mr Harwood and Mr Beard and it would be my preferred practice is to any points that they make that we haven't already got in I like to put it in the text to save you having to write so I just ask if we could have our more mid-morning break when Mr Beard or Mr Harwood whoever's second finishes and then I will send it through but the advantage of that is then you have one copy in the effectively with everything in from the appellant and you don't yes. have to write anything down so that's yes. my would be my preferred way if possible please yes what what I was going to suggest you you jumped the gun there what I was going to suggest is that we hear from Mr Beard the the the, the council's case then we hear the rule sixes case I won't take a break between those, particularly as you've now updated me on your timing. We'll take a short break, but I wouldn't anticipate taking a lunch break. We'll take a short break, um, 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes, and then we'll hear. So, so we'll hear from all of those uh, opposing the development. Then we'll take a short break and then we'll hear from from uh, the, the appellant who's supporting it. it. Is that clear for everyone? So I would expect that we'll be wrapping up 2 to 2.30, so it will be a late lunch. Yes. OK. OK, then. Well, uh, no other um, housekeeping matters from me. I'm just going to wait for Mr. Beard's um, uh, 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 closing to come through, um, if you don't mind. Well, while you're doing that, Mum, can I make one other point? My preference as well would be while Mr. Harwood and Mr. Beard, as I'm obviously focusing on typing, I would quite like to turn my camera off so I can just, and also I think it's less distracting for you if you don't have anyone but the speaker in front of you. No, that's fine. Mr. Harwood as well. Uh, that, that, that's fine. I, I don't have a, 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 a view on that, really. Madam, may, yeah. I have, Madam, may I just have a moment? I'm having terrible connection problems. I'm on a, um, a 5G connection because my landline, broad, broadband, has gone out this morning. May I just have two minutes and just turn off my camera and make sure that that email has been sent to the case officer. Okay, Mr. Beard, thank um, you. Give me a moment. I won't adjourn because I'm expecting that that's come through any minute. Madam, I, I apologise for that. I, I can see that my emails bounced back um, because of the connection problems, but that should be with the case officer now. And I apologize. Okay, I, I've just sent a message to say can they send it through straight away. <clears throat>
Mm. It hasn't gone through yet. Oh, sorry, madam. I can see that it has sent this time. I don't know if my little friends have received. It's, it is well. just this last second or so popped oh. up on my screen. Okay. I'm, I'm so sorry. The My connection is quite slow. So, um, well, I'll get it. So I, I've, uh, they're on to it. As soon as they get it, they'll send it to me. I'm grateful. Right. I'm sorry, everyone, but I, I really would like to have it in front of me. Oh, just come through. Mom, can I confirm I've received it as well? Thank you. Thank you. I'm ready when you are. Sorry, I'm just printing it. Mr. Oh, I beg your pardon, madam. Sorry, and I, I, I don't want to have the print going while I'm listening. I find it very distracting. I understand, madam. I apologise for the disruption I've caused again. I will take Mr. Beard's closing as IQ 33. Thank you very much, Mr. Beard, when you're ready. Uh, thank you, madam. I apologize in advance for any um, typographical errors. They're entirely uh, my own, my inability to uh, spot my own errors. And I, I begin by way of introduction by saying in accordance with the local planning authority statement of case and written evidence submitted in support thereof, the primary purpose of these closing submissions is to substantiate the local planning authority's reasons for, refuse, for, for refusing permission. As every witness appearing at the inquiry on behalf of the council confirmed, no part of the, uh, no part of the local planning authority's evidence case is intended to do otherwise. The local planning, uh, the authority's evidence and these submissions, therefore, should not be interpreted as justifying a refusal of permission for any reason other than that, than as recorded in uh, the local planning authority's decision notice. And this appeal relates to the determination, uh, to a determination contrary to officer's recommendation. Those appointed to appear on behalf of the local planning authority of the inquiry have been scrupulously careful to ensure that the lo lawful decision 
of the committee is properly represented and defended in this appeal. The application for planning permission, the subject of this appeal, was reported to the council's uh, committee on, as we know, on the 10th of March of 2022, with an officer and recommendation to grant conditional planning permission, subject to conclusion of the suitable planning obligation. Following careful consideration and debate, the democratically elected members of the committee resolved to refuse the revised application, contrary to officer's recommendation, and sub subsequently approved the four reasons for refusal by resolution at the subsequent meeting of the committee on the 6th of April, 2022, excuse me. Whatever else may be said uh, about the determination of the application, the subject of this appeal, on the information then available, the democratically elected councillors were entitled as a matter of law and as a matter of planning judgment to refuse to grant planning permission. Notably, the appellant cannot and does not now contend otherwise. Accordingly, that decision should be accorded due deference in the determination of this appeal. On any view, the elected, mem elected members fundamentally disagreed with officers' erroneous advice regarding the proper interpretation and application of development plan policy uh, within that should read London plan policy, I beg your pardon. Following the examination of the evidence in the inquiry, uh, the authority maintains its four reasons for refusals. For refusal, excuse me, each of which has been substantiated by the Council's four expert witnesses, whose written evidence has withstood scrutiny. The same not can, cannot be said of the appellant's written evidence, notwithstanding its extraordinary attempt to overcome the manifest failure of its original evidence to properly consider uh, the main issues in the, pe in the appeal. Okay. In this appeal, oh dear. I don't know what's going wrong with it, but it should read, in this appeal, the LPA contends, I'm sorry for that. Yeah, we're up on it. Yes, the proposal fails to accord with the adopted development plan policies identified in the council's decision notice and that other material considerations do not indicate the planning permission should be granted. For the reasons explained in the council's evidence, submitted evidence, the appeal proposal is unacceptable in planning terms and the adverse effects of granting permission uh, would significantly and demonstrably outweigh any benefits uh, secured by the scheme. Um, mindful of your, your legal duties, Madam, when determining this Section 78 appeal, having regard to the protracted uh, history concerning the lawful determination of the planning merits of redeveloping the, the appeal site, these closing submissions also address matters relevant to the lawful development of the planning appeal. I then set out um, an outline of the, uh, the the five main topics that I'll cover uh, in the remainder of these submissions. Starting with the proper approach, um, the proper approach to the determination of this appeal is not in dispute. By section 72, 70, subsection 2 of the 1990 Act, when determining each appeal, the inspector uh, must have regard to the provision of the development plan so far as material to the application and other other considerations and pursuant to the duty under section 38.6 of the 2004 act and determine each appeal in accordance with the plan unless material considerations indicate otherwise. The main parties agree that the most important development plan policies to the determination of the appeal are not out of date. And consequently, in response to the inspector's specific inquiry query at the early stage of the inquiry, all parties agree that the so-called tilt and balance within paragraph 11D of the framework is not engaged in the present appeal. The appellant contends that the proposal accords with the development plan considered as a whole so far as material and properly conceded that the presumption in favour of sustainable development within paragraph 11C of the framework will not apply if you, Madam, uh, conclude that the proposal does not fully accord with the development plan. It is trite, but nevertheless important to observe that the appeal must be determined on the whole of the evidence before the decision maker, taking account of all material planning considerations. In that latter regard, there is no dispute as to the materiality of any consideration addressed in the evidence before you, Madam, or, or any material dispute on the relevant legal framework applicable to the determination of the appeal. It necessarily follows that the resolution of the main issues in dispute of this appeal essentially involve matters of planning judgment for, for, you, for, for the decision maker, including the weight to be accorded to any material consideration. Likewise, the weight to be attached to the evidence submitted or any part thereof is ultimately a matter, matter, a matter for you. 
turning then to some preliminary uh, matters, uh, some preliminary issues. First of all, the agreed matters, the main statement of common ground and the topic specific statement of, ground, statement of common ground on heritage. And I'm referring there um, as the uh, as the footnotes make clear uh, to the most recent um, um, uh, iterations thereof, confirm that the areas of agreement between the appellant and the council are considerable and assist you, madam, to focus upon the relatively limited matters that remain in dispute. So the avoidance of doubt, in accordance with the inquiry's procedural rules and the case management directions made by you, madam, the submitted statements of common ground in this appeal have been agreed by uh, the LPA on the basis that all reasons for for refusal cited in the decision notice represent the totality of matters not agreed by the planning committee. Put simply, save for matters explicitly contradicted by members' decision to refuse planning permission, properly understood by reference to the deliberations of the planning committee recorded in the approved minutes of the meeting on 10th of March of 2022, and the LPA has uh, agreed, has agreed the appellant's proposed drafts uh, incorporating material drafts of the Statement of Common Ground, incorporating material aspects of the analysis within the committee report and addendum prepared by officers. Planning history, section three of the main Statement of Common Ground provides an accurate record of the site's planning history prior to the determination of the application of the subject of this appeal. For the avoidance of doubt, the agreed record confirms that the local planning authority has never lawfully considered an application for planning permission prior to the refusal of permission the subject of this appeal. Notwithstanding the extent to which the appellant and its witnesses rely upon the planning history of the appeal site, for the sake of clarity and to avoid legal error, it is both necessary and appropriate to record that the local planning authority's decision to refuse permission to subject the appeal is the only lawful de de determination of the planning merits associated with the redeveloping the appeal site. In that regard, the authority has never agreed that the two previous unlawful determinations cited in section three of the main statement of common ground, albeit material considerations in the present appeal, constitute an endorsement by elected members of the previous planning judgments made by officers, recommending that planning permission should be granted. For the sake of completeness only, before deciding that the unlawful decisions to grant planning permission should be quashed on both occasions, the High Court considered the application of Section 31-2A of the Senior Courts Act and concluded that it had not been Shown, it had not been shown to be highly likely that the outcome of the determination would not have been substantially dif different if the illegality complained of had not taken place. And I, 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 I might just add there, um, it, it follows it follows that no assumptions could be made as to what might have happened. Had officers considered, had, sorry, had members considered, um, had members considered the, no, in fact, I, I won't say that, madam, because that, that, that takes it too far. Forgive me for, for, for hesitating there. I, I'll come back to that at the end if, if, if need be. I don't think I, I need to. I apologize for that. Viability, excuse me for a moment. Viability. Local planning authority relies upon, but does not repeat here, the observations made when opening its case and the inquiry regarding the appellant's unreasonable attempt to rely upon revised financial viability appraisal in this appeal. For the avoidance of any doubt, the local planning authority's decision to refuse planning permission had regard to the viability assessments available in March of 2022, which have not changed. Members were entitled, as a matter of planning judgment, to disagree with officers' view, that the revised proposal represented an acceptable balance in regard to the very substantial change in the strategic priorities of development plan policy. Following the High Court's 11th of June 2020 decision to quash uh, the authority's unlawful grant of planning permission, the appellant chose to persist with its application for planning permission for the proposed development now the subject of the appeal. Following the local planning authority's 8th of April 22 to determination to refuse planning permission, for reasons that have never been explained in evidence, the appellant chose to delay the submission of this appeal to the Secretary of State for over five months. Moreover, the appellant chose to submit its appeal without updating its viability 
evidence first, I beg your pardon. Uh, for that reason, the local planning authority was left with no option other than to defend this appeal on the basis of the viability information before, sorry, I've left out the word information after viability, before the committee in March of 2022. Without prejudice to matters agreed within the main statement of common ground, the local planning authority maintained its position that the viable, oh gosh, before the inquiry is agreed as at, as at March of 2022. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm there. Risk. Uh, in that regard, it is important also to record that the appellant chose to acquire the appeal site in September 24 to 14 for the purpose of redeveloping the land. That was a commercial decision involving foreseeable adverse risks. The appellant has been advised by leading professional experts throughout. At all times, therefore, managing the commercial risks associated with securing planning permission were the sole responsibility of the appellant. Planning decisions must be taken in the public interest. Uh, the private commercial interests of the appellant are not material to the determination of this appeal. Turning then to the main issues, and um, I'll deal with these relatively swiftly. So far as material to, uh, to the, uh, the LPA's reasons for refusal, main issues identified by, uh, by you, Madam, and agreed by the parties and cons considered in turn. Madam, just, just a side reference, I, I, I'm not, uh, obviously I'm not going to address the broader um, heritage issues that um, are relating to heritage assets that were not considered by the committee uh, in the reasons for refusal. Cultural facilities, the effect of the appeal proposal on the, on the provision of, of cultural facilities in use by creative industries. The examination of the evidence in this inquiry has confirmed that the proposed development will result in the loss of the existing photographic studio use, which should, be properly, which should properly be considered to be a cultural facility in use by creative industries, contrary to the objectives, <laughs> the objectives of London Plan Policy H5. Sorry. Okay. At the application stage, the, the appellant did not make any attempt to justify the loss of a cultural facility used by creative industries for the purposes of London Plan Policy uh, HC5. In fact, the applicant completely ignored the significant change uh, to the Mayor of London's priorities regarding culture and creative industries, which evolved over the course of the application. On the oh, excuse me, forgive me. On the information available in March of 2022, the committee was entitled to conclude, as a matter of fact, that the proposal would result in the loss of the existing photographic studio, a cultural facility used by creative industries. Significantly, the appellant now concedes that Eagle Wharf is a cultural uh, facility afforded protection by London Plan Policy HC5, apparently abandoning its long-standing contention that reason for refusal one is premised on a clear and obvious misinterpretation of London Plan Policy HC5. On any view, that concession demonstrates that members properly understood that officers' recommendation to grant planning permission was predicated on a flawed interpretation and application of uh, London Plan Policy HC5. On that base al basis alone, without prejudice to the proper approach identified uh, above, the examination of the evidence demonstrates a compelling case for dismissing this appeal for the re reasons recorded in the Local Planning Authority's decision notice. A refusing permission dated 8th of April. Moreover, it was reasonable in the circumstances for the committee to conclude, as a matter of planning judgment, that the loss of the cultural facility was contrary to the objectives of policy HC5 of the London Plan and policy LP10 of the, the Hackney Plan. In support of its case, uh, the authority relies upon the compelling evidence induced by and on behalf of the Rule 6 party, which was examined on day two of the inquiry, regarding home and oh gosh studios so, sorry 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 mr bid uh, okay. paragraph 40 in could you uh, read I'll, I'll read paragraph 40 again okay in, in support of its case the local planning authority relies upon the compelling evidence induced by and on behalf of the rule six party which was examined on a uh, day two of the inquiry regarding home and studios yeah. the oral evidence presented by the late mr vince mccartney 
Mrs. Uh, Mikey and Billy McCartney and Mr. Building demonstrate that the appellant's wholesale fa failure to understand the operation of the existing premises as a uniquely important and significant cultural facility, the loss of which cannot be sanctioned without compelling justification. For the avoidance of doubt, without prejudice to the matters agreed by the local planning authority in the main statement of common ground, the appellant's evidential evidence does not come close to providing that justification. In support of its case on this first main issue, uh, uh, the authority also invites you, Madam, to prefer and accept the authoritative evidence of um, Ms. Raja uh, Masawi. I'm going to say, call her RM, just so I don't get tangled, uh, tongue, tongue tied. Uh, manager, uh, manager for the cultural and community spaces at risk program at the Greater London Authority, which, as she explains in her evidence, is part of the Mayor of London's Cultural and Creative Industries Unit. In the present appeal, RM sorry Roger, is the only suitably qualified expert witness entitled to opine upon the matters concerning the strategic priorities set out in the Mayor of London's cultural strategy and cultural infrastructure plan policies, their interrelationship with the Mayor's vision for good growth generally, and relevant uh, strategic policies within the London plan in particular. As RM uh, explained, uh, it, it is the role of the Mayor of London's cultural and community spaces at risk program to provide culture specific expertise uh, that helps to protect against uh, that helps to protect against the risks threatening london's cultural and creative spaces moreover uh, rm's evidence confirmed home and studios to be rich in cultural heritage providing a unique cultural offer and in line with the london plan it should be protected and promoted I am also confirmed that the officer's recommendation to grant permission for the proposed development failed to correctly identify the site as cultural infrastructure quite properly. Uh, the local planning authority's planning witness, Ms. Slade, CS, endorsed uh, Ms. Masawi's evidence without reservation or hesitation. The local planning authority also invites you, Madam, to agree that this, despite strenuous cross examination, um, Ms. Masawi's expert evidence emerged unscathed and unchallenged. Forgive me, let me just turn that um, off. It's my fault. For the avoidance of doubt, the appellant's case on the proper interpretation and application of mayoral policies relevant to this main issue amounted to assertions unsupported by evidence. Could I put it unsupported by expert evidence? I think that's more accurate. In that respect, paragraph 47, <laughs> the appellant's attempts to dismiss RM's evidence as a sideshow betrays its total failure to consider the existing use of the appeal site as a cultural facility. That failure necessitated the appellant's futile attempt, by way of expanding Mr. John Stevens's original proof of evidence of dependencies, dependencies to rebut the compelling evidence submitted on behalf of the LBA and the Rule 6 Party in support of this main issue. In support of its case on this issue, the local planning authority defers to the Rule 6 party's expertise in terms of the operational requirements of Eagle Wharf, Wharf as a cultural facility used by creative industries. Specifically, the LPA endorses the compelling evidence presented by the Rule 6 party as it relates to the loss of the existing premises comprising the now acknowledged cultural facility at the appeal site. In terms of the appellant's asserted case that the employment full space within the proposed development complies with the requirements of Hackney Local Plan Policy LP2, LP10, the evidence heard of the inquiry demonstrates without any doubt that the existing cultural facility will not be reprovided in qualitative terms. Even if it were, no pro provision has been made for continued occupation by the current occupiers, such as a decant strategy. No safeguards have been put in place to safeguard the space for occupation by business in creative and cultural sectors. And this had add weight to, to this element of the harm. For all these reasons, uh, the proposed development does not accord, we say, with the London Plan Policy HC5 or Hackney uh, Local Plan Policy L L10, and as such, only on, the, on not only, sorry, as such, on the appellant's own case, forgive me, planning permission should be refused. Shall be refused. Goodness. Turning then to heritage assets. Effectively, appeal proposal on the significance and locally listed buildings on the locally listed buildings on the appeal site and whether it would preserve or enhance the character and of the region's canal conservation area. Eagle Wharf 
is locally listed and on a designated heritage asset located within the RCCA where it is identified as making a positive contribution to the capture and the appearance of the, the, the conservation area. With the exception of the too late, of too late 19th century ranges and an early 20th century chimney, the redevelopment proposes the demolition of the majority of the locally listed buildings on the site. In support of its uh, case that members were entitled to conclude that permission should be refused on heritage grounds, uh, the authority relies upon the heritage evidence presented by Mr. Dwyer and the planning evidence by Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Slade as follows. Designated heritage chested. Uh, the buildings in the appeal site are collectively locally listed and considered to have significant value as a group where the additions and alterations add to the character, richness and historic interest of the conservation area. This collection of buildings are among the last remaining industrial buildings, which are still in, 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 some, in some semblance of industrial use. I put industrial use in, in inverted commas, having regard to Mr. Dwyer's cross-examination. By, by re removing um, significant elements of this group and stripping back to retain uh, the two largest ra ranges, it undervalues the significance and group value of bu buildings on the site. The complex of buildings is currently identified as forming a focal point of key building within the uh, uh, RCCA appraisal, forgive me, I haven't put the reference there, and therefore is a highly valued and important view, which is experienced in both long and short distance views. The loss of elements identified in this view is considered to cause harm to the character appearance of the conservation area. Moreover, the retention of the chimney as a standalone structure appears contrived and results in a loss of context uh, for this important feature. The loss of these buildings results in less than substantial harm, in Mr. Dwyer's view, uh, which he assessed to be towards the middle of less than substantial harm, and the harm is considered in the context of the cons conservation of area, uh, excuse me, taken as a whole. Consequently, paragraph, I hope I've got this reference right, uh, 208 of the current framework is engaged, which requires the harm uh, to be weighed against the public benefits, in this instance, um, the evidence, uh, the evidence of Ms. Slade confirmed in evidence, Ms. Slade confirmed that the public benefits of this application are not considered to outweigh the harm. Non-designated heritage asset uh, within the context of the locally listed buildings, the appeal proposal seeks to remove seeks to removal the majority of the buildings, with, which would destroy the local value of the site, both in terms of loss of uh, physical fabric, which contributes to the way the asset is experienced, but also the important cultural history in the form of the occupation of the site by Homer Studios, an iconic photographic studio, photography studio. The buildings have evolved and have, have, and have been adapted, but many contain earlier fabric, uh, which, still, which can still be experienced and contributes to the local interests, such as the Polinso trusses and iron roof, likely dating from the mid 19th century. I hope I've got that right. Um, and if, I, if, if, if that's not quite right, um, I defer to your note on, on the evidence. Yeah. Um, as such, the, local, the, the total loss of the majority of locally listed buildings is harmful to their significance and local interest. Paragraph 209 of the framework, current framework, requires that balanced judgment be required with regard to the scale of any harm or loss and the significance of the heritage asset. In that regard, the proposals do not take into account the local significance of the non-designated heritage asset as described above. Instead, they result in the irreversible loss of the majority of the buildings that collectively make up the locally listed complex of Home Studios. And as before, we invite you uh, to prefer the local planning authority's evidence, which is, was supported by the Rule 6 Party's heritage witness, Mr. Uh, Kevin Murphy. And obviously, I defer to Melinda and Mr. Howard to deal with that. The public benefits upon which the appellant seeks to rely do not outweigh the less than substantial harm caused to the conservation area or the complete loss of significance to the local listed, locally listed building, buildings. The appellant identifies retention and preservation of the chimney as a benefit of the appeal proposal, given that the removal of the associated structure would result in harm to the significance of the chimney by way of the loss of its stock context, which would compromise understanding of its history and function, and that there is no, no other no current threat to this part of the complex. This is not considered to be a public uh, benefit uh, of the proposal. Furthermore, as Mr. Dwyer made clear in evidence, the local listed building is currently fully occupied and in good condition, and therefore 
is in its optimum use. As such, this cannot be considered to represent a public benefit of the appeal proposal. For these reasons, uh, oh gosh, the proposal, proposal, gosh, <laughs> just, just, just an important word there. The proposal does not accord with London Plan Policy HC1 and Hackney, um, Hackney Policies LP3 and uh, LP4, in so far as a result of the total loss of the significance of the non -de designated heritage asset, as a result of which less than substantial harm will be caused to the Regis Canal conservation area, which is not outweighed, we say by the public benefits resulting from the proposal. Excuse me. Living conditions, uh, main issue three. Whether the repeal proposal will provide acceptable living conditions for the future occupiers in terms of the quality of internal space, provision of communal open space and children's play space. The decision notice records that the application was refused in part on the grounds of the quality of residential accommodation provided. Uh, specifically in respect of the high proportion of single uh, units and a shortfall in provision of communal open space and children's open space. In relation to this main issue, we rely upon the evidence presented by Ms. Slade and Mr. Mr. Callum, who is cross-examined on, on the evidence. The London Plan seeks to minimise single aspect uh, units um, for, for reasons relating directly to the quality of accommodation that they deliver in respect of matters including but not limited to cross-ventilation, light to choice of use, and flexibility and adaptability. The preference for dual aspect units is explicitly set out in Part C of London Plan Policy D6, uh, which states that the provision of dual aspect units should be maximised and single aspect uh, units only provided when necessary to deliver a more appropriate design solution to meet the requirements of Part B in Policy D3, optimising the site capacities for the design-led approach. Excuse me. In respect to the council's case, the Mayor of London has recently adopted housing design, I say recently adopted, uh, adopted housing design standards, London Planning Guidance, the LPG, provides additional support over and above previous iterations uh, of the relevant GLA planning guidance and clarifies the approach to be taken by London's planning authorities when assessing the quality of the design of proposals for new residential development, in particular in, re in relation to dual aspect design and delivery of child play space, both of which matters referred to in this main issue and reason for refusal too. Uh, the housing design LPG also endorses the LPA's requirement for a minimum of 10 metres, 10 metres, 10 square metres per child. Uh, for the reasons explained in the uh, local planning authorities' evidence, the developer fails to comply uh, with Hackney policy uh, LP48 and, and LP50. In respect of the latter, the guidance set out in the Hackney Child Friendly SPD. The evidence from Mr. Davy indicates, on behalf of the appellant, obviously, indicates that no substantive, substantive revisions to the the proposal have taken place since the original design in 2014. This implies that the design was out of such exceptional quality that it complied with development plan policies dating from 2020 and 2021 uh, and other material considerations such as the NDS 2015 housing design standards 2023, the Mayor's Good Growth by Design program 2020 onwards, National Design Guide 2021 could not be improved upon in any way so as to increase the proportions of dual aspect quantum or child space, which is inconceivable. Turning then to, to, to family uh, housing briefly, the effect of the proposals on the provision of family housing in the borough. The local planning authority's decision records that the application was refused in part on the grounds of shortfall in the provision of family housing. Uh, Hackney policy LP14 identifies a preferred housing mix of 33% three plus beds with the remainder providing a lower percentage of uh, one bed and two, then units than two bed units. The proposed development would provide 23, 46% of one bed units, 17%, 34% two beds, and 10, 20%, uh, three plus beds, which clearly diverges from the local planning, from the council's preferred housing mix based on evidence, housing need as defined in, in, in the Hackney plan. The authority recognises that policy LP14 allows some flexibility in applying the referred housing mix if, if this can be justified on the basis of site-specific considerations, including 10 years from time of housing proposed, site location, areas, characteristics, uh, design constraints and scheme viability. 
Accordingly, the appeal proposal fails to deliver an acceptable housing mix in terms of provision of family housing of three or more beds, which is identified in the evidence space supporting uh, the Hackney local plan uh, as being the housing size group most in demand within the borough. As such, the appeal proposal fails to accord with uh, policy LP14, which seeks to achieve a housing mix that responds positively to the evidence housing need of Hackney's population. As with main issue three, uh, when considered in the context of the loss of cultural facility and harm to heritage assets, as well as proposals failure to achieve a satisfactory balance of land uses, which I'm coming on to in a moment, this failure of delivery of housing as officially high quality is unacceptable, we say, and should be given considerable weight. Turning to the balance of uses. Uh, the main issue is the effect of the proposal on the provision of employment core space in the Wedlock Priority Office area, affordable workspace and affordable housing in the borough. The site is located within uh, <laughs> Wedlock uh, POA and therefore Hackney uh, plan policies LP26 and LP27 uh, are germane to the determination of the appeal. The former policy seeks to maximise employment flaws whilst incorporating other priority uses such as conventional affordable housing. I make the reference there. The latter identifies the policy objective of proposals within the Wenlock POA achieving a minimum of 60% employment floor space. These policies do not exist in isolation and must be considered with, with other development plan policies such as London Plan Policy 85, which seeks to protect other uses that contribute to the economic vitality of London. Likewise, local, regional and national planning policy seeks to prevent harm to heritage assets and deliver high quality, excuse me, I'm losing my voice. Start reading paragraph 73 again. Likewise, local, regional and national planning policy seeks to, <coughs> excuse me, uh, to prevent. Oh, sorry, um, sorry, Mr. Beard, can, no. can, paragraph 72, could you just read that again? London Plan Policy HC5. Yes, which seeks to protect other uses um, um, that contribute to the economic vitality of London. Oh, no, the, the evidence, the, the council's evidence, in addition to um, in addition to noting the, the, the importance of the cultural facility, also also notes that uh, the cultural facility and policy HE5 contributes to the economic okay. vitality of London. Okay. Yeah. Sorry for, that, for not being clear. Okay. That. That's the oblique reference there. Yeah. Likewise, local, regional, and national planning policy seeks to prevent harm to heritage assets and deliver high quality housing uh, housing of a mix of ten years, including uh, Hackney Policy LP13, affordable housing, which states that new development must maximise the opportunities to supply genuinely affordable housing site on site, uh, and that the council will seek to the maximum reasonable amount of affordable housing. That being said, as before. Uh, the authority recognises the relevant policies aimed to allow for a degree of flexibility in the delivery, delivery of planning objectives, which is expressed in terms of viability of proposals. As with all material planning considerations, the weight to be given to viability is a matter for you, Madam, having a full regard to development plan policy and all other material considerations. In this case, the authority determined that the viability information was outweighed by the failure of the proposal to comply with other Hackney uh, local plan policies seeking to secure maximisation of employment floor space in line with the policy objective of 60% floor space, whilst concurrently delivering what was considered to be unacceptable contribution towards affordable housing. These failures in respect of the proposed land uses were set alongside the harm resulting from the proposal in respect of the loss of cultural facility and designated and non-designated heritage assets, and the quality of the accommodation that will be delivered as a result of the development, which would include a number of dwellings providing poor quality accommodation and a housing mix which does not accord with the council's uh, uh, evidence housing needs in relation to family size units. This balancing reflects the more recent policies of the London Plan and the wider, sorry, the wider planning objectives of the Mayor of London as articulated in the London Plan, which postate those of the Hackney um, local plan and represent a subtle evolution in the wider policy context within the with, within which the decision was taken. We invite you, Madam, uh, to prefer the evidence of uh, Ms. Slade and Mr. Callum in relation to this main issue. 
Finally, uh, overall planning balance, and I'll deal with this relatively swiftly. The main state statement of common ground sets out the asserted benefits secured by the appeal proposals, which are addressed in the evidence of the slate. The council's written evidence also addresses the various factors upon which the appellant relies in support of its contention that the proposal accords with the development plan and or that other material considerations indicate that planning permission should, should be granted. The local planning authority's evidence addressed the overall planning balance taking account of all material planning considerations and the statutory tests in section 38.6 of the Act. The authority relies upon the written evidence of Ms Slade in relation to the overall planning balance, which is informed uh, by the expert analysis and conclusions within the evidence produced by Ms Masari and Mr Dyer. That evidence was adopted by Mr Callum without reservation. Ms Slade amplified her written evidence uh, taking account of the evidence previously examined at the inquiry, confirming her emphatic view that the appeal proposal is unacceptable in planning terms and the adverse effects of the granting permission would significantly and demonstrably uh, outweigh any benefits secured by the scheme. And I, I recognise there that I, I'm referring there to the, the tilted balance, but Madam, um, you'll have a note of Ms. Uh, Ms. Slade's examination in chief, um, she was emphatic on the basis that the that the proposals the, the, the proposals that did, did not constitute an acceptable form of development uh, by whatever test. I'll, I'll leave it to you, Madam, to 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 to, uh, to check your note and apologise for not being absolutely clear on my note. Essentially, the council has produced an an, an, an evidence <laughs> the missing. Stop. Essentially, the council has produced an evidential basis for dismissing the appeal on the basis of the four reasons for refusal on which the evidence has been produced and, and, and was examined, I beg your pardon, cutting and pasting never goes well, was examined at the inquiry. The materiality of and weight to be given to those considerations is a matter of judgment for you, Madam. However, given the appellant's case and the proposed development accords with the development plan Accords with the development plan, should you, Madam, conclude to the contrary, the appellant does not advance an evidential case to support a grant of planning permission. And Madam, I, I, I ought to add a footnote there, and that was my cross-examination of Mr. Marks on the final day of the evidence. Sorry, Mr. Mr. Beard, what, what is the... So, so at the end of that paragraph, I, if I may, just footnoting there that that submission is based upon my cross-examination so XX, okay. um, colon, SM, um, uh, and Madam, uh, by just by way of conclusion, for all these, <laughs> for all these reasons, gosh, reasons, the council invites you, Madam, respectfully to dismiss this appeal. Madam, I apologise very much for my croaky voice and uh, stilted, uh, stilted uh, delivery. Madam, unless I can assist you further, those are the local planning authorities' submissions in closing. Okay. Thank you very much uh, uh, for that, Mr. Beard. I've taken that as IQ 33. Uh, what I intend to do now, it's now um, 10.59. As I said, I intend to move straight on uh, to the Rule 6 party and invite uh, Mr. Harwood uh, uh, to, to make his closing submissions. I have your closing submission. I've already printed it out and I will take that as IQ 34. Thank, thank you, you madam. Uh, Mr Harwood, whenever you're ready. Yeah. Um, thank you, madam. This is a bad scheme which as policy and finances have evolved has been getting worse. One of London's vital cultural gems will be trashed for a horribly compromised scheme. The Council's planning committee were right to reject it in 2022 and the appeal should be dismissed. The appellant's attempt to redevelop the site has been going on for nearly 10 years. For present purposes, there are three points to note. Firstly, uh, the present application was made in 2017 and itself is little different to the 2016 amendment of the original 2015 application. It fails to reflect changes in policies in the London plan and the local plan, in particular the introduction of development management protection for cultural facilities and improved residential standards. Despite having 
so long to do so, the appellant has made no attempt to understand the operations on the site or what is needed for them to be reprovided. And thirdly, approval of the redevelopment proposals would lead to Home and Studios Limited and their licensees being removed from the site. The grant of planning permission would be the only basis for ending Hoban Studios Landlord and Tenant Act protection. Uh, that threat, which is akin to compulsory purchase, uh, has hung over Margaret, the late Vince, Billy, Mikey, and Mary McCartney for many years. Marie, Marie McCartney. What I say. The delays in the resolution of the appeal, none of which are the responsibility of Hoban Studios are particularly unfortunate. Just deal with the issue on representations. There's one problem in the appeal process which is outstanding. As the appellant chose to resurrect the 2017 planning application following the second judicial review, all of the representations made on the application could have been put in front of the inquiry. That's not happened because of the cyber attack on the council systems. Since many representations were submitted via Hoban Studios, the Rule 6 party has been able to help out by going through its own systems in respect of those. It's remarkable that the appellant has not produced copies of any of the representations which it would have been monitoring. The upshot, though, is that about 160 representations are still missing, including all the statutory and internal consultees. Uh, whether the missing material is sufficiently set out in the 2019 committee report cannot be determined. So the inquiry is not able to take into account representations which those making them would have expected to be in front of the inquiry. Turn then to the planning balance. The appeal can be dealt with quite simply by setting out the planning balance with respect to the main issue, the benefits first of all. The only benefit of the scheme is the provision of housing. This, though, is tempered by three points. Firstly, the absence of any on-site affordable housing and the minimal contribution to off-site affordable housing. Secondly, the poor mix of units and excessive number of single aspect dwellings. And thirdly, the failure to provide sufficient quantum and quality of amenity and place space, not playscape, place space for residents and workers. The employment provision is so poor and harmful to existing employment that it is in no respect a benefit. I need to take a little longer to describe the harms and failings of the scheme. Firstly, the effect of the appeal, appeal proposal on the provision of cultural facilities in use by creative industries. The scheme involves the demolition of a world-renowned cultural facility, which is vital to London's creative industries. It will, at best, disperse, if not destroy, the creative businesses which are based at the site. The success of London as a world city is down to the work, effort and innovation of its people. One vital aspect of that has been creative, but it's not just people, it is places, and places attract and create the people. They bring people together, they develop skills, they create reputation. In the field of photography, Hoban Studios has done that. Its work is world-class and iconic. The studio sizes, layouts, equipment, access are part of that, as are the supporting facilities for changing, casting, meeting and eating, but also the people, the staff, the photographers, designers, lighting, carpentry, makeup, sound people who regularly work there and the studio attracts to it other creative businesses. Hope and Studios is a unique business and location, created by the late Vince and Margaret McCartney, and carried on by them with their sons, Billy and Mikey and daughter Marie. The late Vince introduced the concept of hiring photographic studios. Previously, photographers had used their own studio and known equipment. The family had produced a world-renowned facility, which is one of the stars in London's creative firmament. The studios are called the Abbey Road of Photography by Helmut Newton. The video which the inquiry saw with contributors such as David Bailey, 
demonstrates the regard in which the site is held. The studios are busy and at the heart of the creative hub on the site. As Mr. Ling explained, one off, famous in the industry, clients love it, hair and makeup love it, models love it. And matters such as the hosting of events and private parties is part of the studio's contribution to the creative industries. The varying studio spaces have been designed to accommodate the needs of the industry. They are accessible by vehicles for shoots of the vehicles, of vehicles twice, about twice a week, and to move in equipment and props. The scale and design of the enterprise is critical for shoots for large ensemble TV shows, which require multiple still video shoots for each participant, as well as ensuring that some, such as Love Island contestants, don't bump into each other. So a single corridor links the seven core studios of interlocking doors. This layout is not accidental, but designed from years of experience and knowledge. Hoban Studios provides a service, not just space, studio assistance for each shoot, equipment such as lighting, technical advice, the ability to go and get things for the shoot. The studio assistants are the next generation photographers learning how to interact with clients and to work in a studio before going on to be photographers assistants and going onwards. As Mr Ling explained, a photographer could just turn up with cameras or be assisted in bringing in substantial equipment. This goes beyond lighting. Um, you recall, Madam, the evidence of the late Vince McCartney, who gave examples of equipment to turn, twist a uh, camera and how to put a mirror under a camera, under a car. Now, the significance of these cultural production spaces in the site in particular were spelt out convincingly by uh, Ms. Masawi of the Greater London Authority. And I footnote uh, her very concise and expert at proof uh, generally. The appellant, however, has failed to understand how the site operates, nor has it made any effort to do so. Mr. Stevenson's description of Hoban Studios as a, quote, a supplier of space like any other landlord, end quote, was just wrong. His attempts under cross-examination to say that he had understood the operation were embarrassing. Turn then to questions of values in the Landlord and Tenant Act. The Hoban Studios site is commercially successful and valuable. The appellant's viability assessment, which is in front of the inquiry, values the Hoban Studios part of the site at £25 per square foot, with a yield of 6%. Savills has assessed an existing use value of 13.9 million pounds. Now that same Savills valuation gives a rental for the proposed offices of 35 pounds per square foot with a 5.75% yield, but with the food and drink value being weaker at 20 pounds per square foot and 6.25% yield. Now Hoban Studios limited rent is a market rent under the leases. It's not a concessionary rent or a low one based on expediency. And Mr. Stevenson was wrong to suggest otherwise. And he acknowledged that when he himself made an expert determination of the rent in 2001, he did so in accordance with the lease, obviously the lease at the time, not a concessionary or expedient level. The Hope and Studios leases are protected under the Landlord and Tenant Act 1954. New 15-year leases were entered into with the appellant in 2015. The leases include clauses allowing the appellant to determine them with 12 months' notice. But Home and Studios will be able to obtain new leases from the court unless an exception applies. And the only relevant exception is that in Section 31F of the 1954 Act which is that the landlord intends to demolish or reconstruct the premises comprising the holding or substantial part of his premises or carry out substantial work of construction on the holding or part thereof, and he could not reasonably do so without obtaining possession of the holding. Now, to do that, let alone for it to make any sense to do that approach, 
the appellant will need planning permission for redevelopment. The rent paid by Home and Studios Limited went up almost a third in the June 2020 rent review. The rent is now uh, £17.66 um, pounds pence per square foot, uh, net internal area, NIA. Holman Studios' rent is lower than the Savills valuation because uh, the, the company do not pay rent on tenants' improvements. And I mentioned in the footnote that this is conventional. Um, otherwise, the effect would be the tenants who spend their own money improving their property would pay an increased rent to the landlord because they've increased the rental value of the property. Turn then to the other occupiers and the operation of the Creative Hub. Hope and Studios Limited leased part the, the Hope and Studios Limited leased part of the site is divided between the parts used by the company as part of its core business that's providing studios and services for individual projects and those with longer term occupation arrangements. Now that distinction is fluid. The longer occupancy units involved in photography draw on the company's services to assist in their work. Most of those longer occupancy units have been and can be used as studios. And studios do switch between day hire and long term occupancy depending upon demand. Now, a list of the other occupiers was in Mr. Hodgson's proof, uh, obviously provided well over a year ago. Uh, this is now dated and supplemented by IQ 16 uh, during the, you recall, in the September evidence. Mm -hmm. The, the longer occupancy units include seven which are used as photographic studios. Other creative businesses are two photographic agencies, fundraising strategists, an actor's or model agency, product design, sound studio, and prop bank. The current non-creative occupiers are, I apologize to describe as non-creative, but an architect, uh, an environmental consultancy, an osteopath, although the latter does get work from photographers with cricked backs. The site attracts and retains creative businesses. It is a creative hub. Another notable feature is the full occupancy of the space in the Hoban Studios leases. The vacant unit two is in the hands of the appellant who are allowing it to deteriorate. The principal issue is the loss of the high quality still and film photographic studios on the site, which are known as Hoban Studios and which comprise the space occupied by Hoban Studios and Limited and their licensees are in photographic or related industries. This is the loss of the facility, not the individual occupant Hoban Studios Limited, as the Rule 6 Party has always made clear. I do note at this point, and I'll come back to it later, that the removal of the existing businesses on the site, including Home and Studios Limited, is though contrary to local plan policy LP29. Turn then to the appellant's proposals and the inadequacy of the basement, first of all. The basement proposals are inadequate for studio. What will be lost is any possibility of a major photographic studio. What will be gained is basement storage. The problems of basement studios are explained by the late Vince McCartney, who has worked in them. Never again would sum up his view. And no one has found any current basement studios. Now, despite working on this project for nine years, Mr. David did not know anything about the design of photographic studios, nor had he troubled to find out. His proof sought to set out how his basement design could work as a photographic studio by drawing photographic coves uh, containing double doors into storage areas. He was wholly unaware that the curved even walls of coves cannot contain doors, nor that anyone walking across the painted floor of a cove would leave marks affecting the affinity view. So it could not be used to go to or from a store or in order to understand that the painting of doors and floors would rapidly jam a door. He had no understanding of camera vectors or depth of fields. His efforts to demonstrate the suitability of his scheme involved lifting parts of the Hoban Studios website and claiming his basement was like that. 
Now, prior to the 2015 application being made, Hope and Studios had been consulting that told the appellant the scheme would not work. Uh, the appellant made no attempt to engage with Hope and Studios Limited about those criticisms and refer to the first judgment um, of Mr. John Howe, QC. Now, this lack of engagement of this problem is illustrated by the question of seasoning heights. The original 2015 application had contained columns in the basement studios. Hoban Studios had pointed out that these severely constrained photography. The 2015 application was amended to remove most of the basement level columns. When Hoban Studios found out about that change from the 2016 committee report, they questioned whether the building could be constructed without the, the columns, and uh, given reference to uh, how that was dealt with in the judgment. Mm -hmm. The failure to consult Hogan Studios and to give them a chance to comment on that issue was one reason for the quashing of the first permission. Now, as part of those judicial review proceedings, Hogan Studios submitted an engineer's letter dated the 17th of July 2017, which said that transfer beams of one meter to two meters in depth would be required, that the ceiling to ground floor gap of 700 millimeters was not large enough and that mechanical services, including ventilation ducts of up to 1.2 metres, would have to go under the basement ceiling as well. The appellant only responded to those points in the August 2023 updated evidence, so over six years later. The appellant structural engineers, the Tullys, say that the slab would have to be between 1.0 and 1.4 metres, without producing any calculations. Now the current proposals are sore flawed. Whilst a deeper space between the ground floor and basement ceiling is proposed of up to 1.5 meters, it's still inadequate to support the columnless parts of the basement as uh, um, rule six parties, consultants, engineers, HRW say. Even if there was space for a slab that could bear the load, there would be insufficient space for the ground floor surface and basement ceiling finishes and utilities, such as power and communication cables, let alone ventilation and heating ducts. The Tully's proposal would lack flexibility as well, as they say the basement level internal walls would have to be load bearing, so you can't just move them or knock them down. The late Vince and Billy McCartney explain the need for particularly rapid ventilation when smoke is used in shoots. Mr. Davy was drawn to cast around for, uh, quote, additional structures around the stairs or ducts in corridors. The proposals did not achieve the distances of depth of field, which Billy McCartney and Mr. Ling explained are needed, in particular for fashion photography. Guaranteed access for heavy equipment and vehicles is required. Cars and vans will not be able to get into the proposed basement studios. Small bands, vans will be able to get into the lift and could be unloaded from the lift in the basement, but at the price of blocking it. But the larger 7.5 tonne trucks, which are actually used to lift, carry lighting equipment, will not be. In the appellant scheme, they'd have to be unloaded in the street and equipment manhandled to the basement studios via a single large lift. Um, we point out that large shoots will usually require three uh, large lighting trucks. So the basement proposal is inadequate for these purposes. Turn then to the scope of cultural facilities. What cultural facilities could be provided in the scheme is restricted by the planning use and by the design and pricing of the commercial development. The planning application is revised for the new use classes is for class EGI quote, an office to carry out any operational or administrative functions. As Hope and Studios pointed out before the refusal, this is a narrow category for any cultural facilities. Now, of course, there can be a degree of judgment about what is or is not an office, but it might or might not be the case that the photographic studio is an office. An artist studio for painting or sculpture, an experimental kitchen, one of the Palance of suggestions, or rehearsal spaces would not be office uses. As the planning application is for EGI use, the initial use of those parts of the site has to be for offices. The use classes order only applies to changes after a use has been commenced. 
The condition initially proposed by the main parties, so by main party, I mean the council and the appellant, was to prevent changes from EGI use. The revised condition in the 1st of Feb 2024 note would allow a subsequent change to any EG use. Uh, and I, I set out what that is from the use classes order in the footnote. There's no evidence that such a wider EG use would accord with the priority office area, nor evidence assessing its impacts. For example, the noise impact assessment considers the effect of office use on residential flats within the buildings, not industrial uses. Whilst an EG use would be acceptable in a residential area, so by definition, it does not follow that such uses are acceptable in a mixed residential building. And the planning system, of course, is there to prevent conflicting and competing uses, not setting disputes up. First, then turn to the, the office, then turn to the officers. There have been faint attempts by the appellant to suggest that the above ground officers could be part of the reprovided cultural facilities. However, they're not designed as such, but as high quality officers. Their use is not limited to cultural uses, nor is there any bias in favour of cultural uses other than for an unspecified part of the affordable workspace, and that's in the, the planning obligation I give the reference. On Mr Mark's assertion, a cultural facility could be provided by granting planning permission for an unrestricted office use, even if there was no reason to think that the offices would be used as cultural facilities rather than housing, say, accountants. Even if he applied that approach only to existing cultural facilities which were akin to offices, and he didn't say that, it would lead to loss of cultural facilities on the vast majority of occasions. Um, so just to perhaps reinforce that point, Madam, uh, the reprovision of a cultural facility is not done by granting planning permission for officers. Um, there needs to be so obviously far more than that. Thank you very much, Mr. Holmes. No, thank, thank you, Madam. The appellant's belated attempt to rely on the above ground offices is important because the basement is much smaller than the current cultural facility. So the proposed basement, I set out the figures, about 1,200 um, square metres, gross internal, just under 1,000 net internal, whilst the existing site is 4,700 gross internal, 3,300 net internal. So the great majority of the present floor space constitutes the cultural facility. Uh, all of the floor, present floor space can realistically be occupied as such. And all of that cultural facility is protected. Turn then to the appellant's approach to the issue and the evidence. The theme which has run through the appellant's case and evidence is that they are utterly clueless about how the site operates how photographic studios function, about how cultural hubs work. What is shocking is they've had nearly a decade to find all this out. The loss and replacement of the photographic studios and their importance have been issues from the start, yet they failed to find anyone who knows anything about photographic studios. Mr. Davy has spent nine years designing, he says, a photographic studio without knowing how an infinity cove works. In examination in chief, he accepted he was not an expert in photographic studios. He evidence, in fact, betrayed no understanding of how to design a photographic studio. Despite the length of his involvement with the scheme, is all evidence consisted of unworkable suggestions made on the hoof, sort of trying to get vehicles down the courtyard staircase into the basement. Mr. Stevenson is a professional witness, but not an expert witness on cultural or photographic activities. He was completely out of his depth on those matters, having no understanding of those sectors. 
He'd also failed to attempt to understand how Hogan Studios Limited or their licensees operated. Miss um, Avanitakis. Helen Avanitakis is a business manager, having started business development in the creative sector. She has so never run or designed a photographic studio. Miss Avanitakis has never visited Hogan Studios in any capacity, despite her former employer, Tom Dickinson, using Hogan Studios. She misunderstood the scheme, believing that all of the commercial space was for creative uses. And of course, she was not called to give evidence. The design district where she presently works has one small studio and possibly a second if you count a corridor. Her understanding of the business model of photographic studios was hopeless. It was wrong for her to believe that equipment has got smaller or that post-production means that shooting is quicker. Post-production is more expensive, but in any event, the job of the photographer is to create a good image in the studio. On the evidence, Ms. Avanitakis knows very little about running or designing a photographic studio, nor is she able to explain cultural facilities and needs in London. Uh, then Mr. Davis, he runs a small building and design business, some of which seems to involve small studios. He first said that he had built over a hundred before admitting in his later email that the vast majority of which were for sound recording. There's no evidence that he has any competence in designing or building a photographic studio like Holborn Studios. He's not visited the site. Again, he was not called to give evidence. So what is most shocking, I do use that word again quite appropriately here, what is most shocking is not that the appellant and its witnesses and written contributors were completely clueless about the cultural issues in this case, although that's startling enough, but that the appellants have simply not been interested in finding out about them. In 10 years, they've made no credible effort to understand what their tenants and occupiers do, the value of it, or how those facilities could be replaced. Turn then to the question of alternative sites to Hoban Studios. Given the policy requirements to protect or reprovide the cultural facility on site, the existence of other alternatives is not important. It's worth noting, though, that none of them compare to Hoban Studios in size, quality or reputation. There is no photographic studio which provides the service and capabilities that Hoban Studios do. As Mikey McCartney said, they have their own qualities. They work in different ways at different times, and we have the ability to work in all of these ways all of the time. Many of the examples suggested by the appellant are outside of the central London market, required by the people who book the jobs, by the production companies and the day-to-day -day crew. As Billy McCartney observed, sofas don't care where they are, but celebrities do. None of these are an alternative to Hoban Studios, and that increases the harm from the scheme. Even if there were alternatives in London, the loss of successful cultural facilities would still be harmful. It is even more surreal for Mr. Stevenson to carry out limit, quote, limited high level research, i.e. is accepted, use Google, to identify large studios elsewhere in Europe. Those were all smaller than Hoban Studios, Mr. Stevenson failing to appreciate the photographic uses of the license space. But in any event, it's not government policy to transfer jobs to Paris or Barcelona. Then turning to the question of alternative sites to relocate to. Uh, the appellant's case that Hoban Studios Limited should have looked for alternative sites to move to is also surreal. It makes the error which it wrongly accuses the Royal Six Party of making, of concentrating on the future of the limited company's business rather than the facilities on the site. If the company could relocate, then the studios at Eagle Wharf would still be lost. And saying that the Royal Six Party should have taken steps to find an alternative site is victim blaming. Hoping studios have no desire to leave, 
The McCartney family have rightly been putting their energies into running the business and seeking to stay in their suitable and successful premises. The appellant have never suggested alternative premises for Hope and Studios to move to. Their references in the inquiry evidence to alternatives has been based on an abject failure to appreciate the accommodation needed for a studio of this quality, the function and social sides which work, and the connectivity between the studios and the work of most of the other occupiers. Mr Stevenson's principal alternative sites were offices, which he had to admit were not suitable, lacking 5.2 metre ceiling heights and access into the buildings for 7.5 tonne trucks. The benefits of an inner London location within reach of publishers, agencies, photographers and clients have completely passed the appellant by. Turn then to development plan policy on cultural facilities. The London Plan 2021 contains a development management policy in HC5A to protect cultural facilities, and that's unlike the 2016 London Plan. Mr Marx accepts that the Hoban Studios complex is a cultural facility and that in the terms of the policy, it's appropriate to protect it. Whilst the protection of a cultural facility may involve its replacement, that must be the same or better quality. The facility is not protected otherwise. To the extent that Mr Marx suggests that a poorer quality replacement would accord with the policy, he was wrong. On the expert evidence above, and the only expertise was on the Hoban Studios side, even if the basement could be used as a cultural facility, it would not remotely replace the existing studios or the complex as a whole. The local plan LP10D says, development involving the loss of arts, culture and entertainment facilities will be resisted. It's common ground that this applies. It continues, uh, quotes, unless reprovided, which goes to the quality of the replacement on site. And this is to be in accordance with other policy requirements, which means meeting other policies. There are no policies that prevent reprovision of the cultural facility. The appellant does not try to rely on the exception of the policy, nor do they make the necessary contribution to do so. And I set that out, which is that where the loss of the facility necessary to secure development will deliver wider planning benefits for the community. And this can be demonstrated to the council satisfaction, a contribution towards cultural, public art or creative projects should be provided in accordance with the SPD. There's no contributions made. Given the inadequate proposals for the basement, the scheme fails to reprovide the cultural facility. The appeal scheme is therefore contrary to the development plan policies for the protection of cultural facilities. The importance of the studios and so the significance of the breach was set out by Ms. Uh, Masari from the Greater London Authority, by Nick Perry of the Hackney Society in a local context, and by the evidence of the McCartney family and Mr Ling for Hoban Studios. That breach is so significant in this case that planning permission should be refused on this ground alone. Turn then to the other issues. Uh, firstly, the effect of the appeal proposal on the significance of the local list of building on the appeal site and whether it would preserve or enhance the character appearance of the conservation area. The Hope and Studio site is a rare survivor of the industrial uses and industrial buildings along the canal side. It continues to make things, albeit digital images, and does so in the industrial buildings which have grown up over time. The studios are of heritage interest in their own right, of local listing, and being a building of townscape merit. And Mr Murphy for Hoban Studios explained, is of local value, illustrating its evolution over time as a working industrial and post-industrial site in this part of London. Specifically, characterised historically by these things. Its very ordinariness is at the core of its heritage significance and its contribution to the Regent's Canal conservation area. The contrast between later, simpler and generic elements of the site with the older elements makes its evolution legible. And that contrast tells the story of the site. 
The present use of the site is consistent with an extension of its previous industrial uses. It now produces iconic photographic and moving images instead of producing physical goods. The use of the site, a commercial, non-residential, productive use, that has repurposed the former industrial use of the site, and which contrasts with nearby 19th century housing, forms part of the significance of the site and its contribution to the conservation area. So the site contributes both architectural and historic interest to the conservation area, which it is in, and by its role in the setting to the significance of other heritage assets. There is less than substantial harm to designated heritage assets in the middle of the range, uh, identifying the Regents Canal, Arlington Square conservation areas and the setting of listed buildings in Shepherdess Walk. Considerable weight has to be attached to this harm. There are no public benefits to outweigh that harm. The evidence of Kevin Murphy, Nick Perry and Adam Dwyer is persuasive and they all have substantial local expertise. There will be substantial harm to Hoban Studios, the non-designated heritage asset, and also harm to the setting of locally listed buildings. The heritage interest of Hoban Studios includes, uh, goes twice, uh, includes the studio and the iconic images taken in it, as identified in the local listing assessment. Most of the studio uses, and so the historic interest in the studios is in the building proposed for demolition. Historic England's criticism of the 2015 proposals remain good. The chimney would read as a standalone structure. It would be devoid of function. Historic England considers the scale, weight and proximity of proposed development really competes for the chimney. They said the scheme should be reduced in height and or set further away from the chimney. Now, none of that was changed. Mr Murphy rightly said that surviving elements on the site are, and I quote, engulfed by substantial new development that is at best generic and at worst simply alien in its context. There are no heritage benefits. Dr Mealy could only suggest tidying up the facades as a heritage benefit, but the appellant could do that anyway. The small number of buildings which, are, which will be retained are not under threat and are presently occupied by viable long-term revenue generating uses. They can be retained and maintained in the present use. The appellant acknowledges that some internal features contribute to the architectural interest of the buildings. However, they say there's no statutory consent is required for internal alterations listed on list of buildings. It's better to record them, rip them out and demolish the buildings rather than let them remain. Now that is a, a truly bizarre approach. These particular items are trusses which are holding the roof up. There's no report identifying a need to replace them. Hope and Studios have no need to remove them. The appellant as landlord has no need to remove them. There's no reason why they cannot stay for many more years. Whilst the L-shaped building will be more visible in the scheme, it will have a backdrop of much larger new modern buildings in its background. The current integration of the site and the canal site will be lost and the occupation of the two sites is divided. There is a danger in understating the heritage harm. The site is all of historic interest and of some architectural interest comprising almost an acre of a conservation area in a highly prominent location. A substantial part of their interest will be swept away. Turning then to living conditions for future occupiers, in terms of the quality of internal space, provision of communal open and children's play space. London Plan Policy DC6 requires schemes to maximise dual aspect and normally avoid single aspect dwellings. The 2023 London Plan guidance says that development should be dual aspect unless there are exceptional circumstances and it's common ground that the guidance is material and is a guide. That's Mr. Mark's uh, evidence orally. It's now common ground that a majority, it's 54% of the dwellings proposed are single aspect. That breaches the normally avoid requirement. Dual aspect, of course, increases light and allows cross ventilation. 
The poor design also contributes to the anticipated overheating of more than half the dwellings in the DSY2 and DSY3 future weather scenarios. Again, it's common ground that this is relevant, with Mr. Marks referring to these assessments as a guide. The scheme provides less than 30% of the required open space. The provision that's put forward is 1,265 square metres. Now, Mr. Hodgson produces figures assessing the requirement from L policies LP48 and LP50, 14 square metres per resident, 149 residents, 2,092 square metres, four square metres per worker, so that's 2,116 square metres on the large assumptions, and then 178 square metres of place space. So uh, Mr. Hodgson's figure uh, is 4,516 in total. Mr. Marks gives requirements of 2,116, so the same for employees, 2,044 square metres for residents, and 102 square metres for place space. That is a significant shortfall. Mr. Marks wrongly counts the 1,265 square metres provision twice, since the requirements are additional to each other. The committee report itself identified the scheme, I quote, falls short of LP48. Any contribution for off-site off off -site space provision uh, under policy LP48C must make up the deficiency, a mere token contribution uh, will not suffice. Yet the £35,000 proposed for the towpath on the north side of the canal, which is already in public use, is just that. The place space is left entirely detailed under a condition it's not shown at all on the application drawings. The proposed condition does not say how much is proposed, except that it is for under fives only. 48 square metres was put forward by Mr. Mark, so just under half of the requirements as he's calculated it. No provision is offered for older children and there are no off-site contributions proposed. Now, it's, it's too late to speculate that any of this can be fixed. And those deficiencies diminish the quality of the development for employees and residents. Turns then to the relationship with the canal side. The scheme also separates the Hoban Studios site from the canal side. The marina is leased by the McCartney family's Eagle Wharf Marina Limited from the Canal and Rivers Trust, and so not from the appellant. Presently, the two sites function together for the benefit and joint of both operations and visitors. If the appeal scheme proposed proceeds, it will be visually and physically separated from the canal side, a point which the appellant had failed to appreciate. Mr. Davis' drawings of the development opening out onto the canal side are entirely wrong. There can be a high barrier between the two. And the appellant cannot expect to reach a deal on access. Indeed, it's made no attempt to agree the future of the studios or the wharf. And the viability of the appellant scheme is so poor that it can hardly be expected to afford a deal. And of course, the McCartney family are entitled to do what they want with their land. Then turning to family housing, local plan policy LP14 requires at least 33% of homes have three or more beds, whilst there should be more two bed than one bed homes. The scheme is 46 one bed, 34 two bed, and only 20% larger homes. That's a comprehensive reversal of the development plan's requirements. And of course, achieving an appropriate mix of housing types including family housing, is the overall aim of government policy. I give the references to the new framework. On affordable housing, the appellant is seeking 50 market dwellings and no affordable homes at all. There's a lack of any affordable housing on site and a minuscule contribution to off-site affordable housing. Now, that is a kick in the teeth to national, London and local policy but also to all Londoners. It is an abject failure to build mixed communities. It's not simply the loss of a benefit, but a housing scheme which is positively harmful in planning terms. 
A failure to provide affordable housing on a large site could not be excused by an off-site contribution, let alone the minuscule one proposed here. The framework requires not only that off-site contributions are robustly justified, but that, and I quote, the agreed approach contributes to the objective creating mixed and balanced communities. Even if a greater contribution is not viable, a failure to contribute to this objective renders the scheme unacceptable. Then in terms of employment floor space in the Wenlock priority office area, the site is in employment use in a designated employment area. Whilst mixed use developments are allowed by policy, at least 60% of new floor space should be old use class B1. The appellant fails to provide is falling short of 54%. It's no excuse to say that the total commercial floor space will increase. Higher densities can be expected in redevelopment, but to maintain the office status of the area, the 6% requirement is required. And as, as we know, a large proportion of the proposed office commercial floor space is a lightless basement, which is unlikely to achieve more than ancillary storage. Then turn to low cost existing businesses and affordable workspace. The High Court identified that the previous development plan policies and employment could justify the refusal of permission. I give the reference to Mr. Justice Dove's judgment. Those policies have since strengthened against the scheme. Hope and Studios provides low cost employment accommodation, both for the studios themselves and for those licensing from the studios. That will be wiped out and the businesses dispersed. The affordable workspace will be more expensive than the current accommodation, the market workspace even more so. Policy LB29B requires the protection of existing low-cost employment floor space, it tells us. Existing low-cost employment floor space must reprovide the maximum economically feasible amount of low-cost employment floor space in perpetuity, reference to Appendix 1, and equivalent rents and service charges suitable for the existing or equivalent uses, subject to current lease arrangements and the desire of existing businesses to remain on site. Now, the site meets the definition, which is in paragraph 817, the reason justification and in Appendix 1, that low-cost employment floor space is employment floor space which may be secondary or tertiary in nature, low quality or specification with cheaper rents or leases, often providing space for startups, creative, I emphasize that, creative or light industrial occupiers, such as artists or maker spaces. And so, madam, any scheme must reprovide this at equivalent rents and service charges. I'm oh, sorry, let's I, I, carry on the text. Uh, existing occupants should be rehoused within the development where possible. Again, Madam, that's part of the, yeah. it yeah. slipped on that paragraph is part of the same quote. Okay, thank you. The purpose of an affordable workspace uh, policy is to create lower cost accommodation for local and specialist businesses which benefit from it. It's not achieved by replacing popular and successful existing workspace with more expensive accommodation. Illustrative of the scheme's failure to engage with current policies, it does not maximise the use of renewable energy, as the wide expanses of roofs without solar panels or green roofs show. Turn then to the development plan and bring us towards the, the balance. The appeal scheme fails to comply with the development plan, being in breach of the cultural facilities, heritage, residential amenity, open space, housing mix and employment policies in the London plan and the local plan. Whilst the plan has to be considered as a whole, the only supported policies are the principal redevelopment in priority office area, city fringe, and some policies on the detail of any scheme. It is though in breach of the policies on the type of development, given the loss of cultural facilities and employment types and lack of employment and affordable housing, and how the development should be carried out, referred to as central amenity and heritage. The benefits to the scheme are modest, simply being the provision of 50 market homes. This benefit is diminished by the majority being substandard in being single aspect, 
the inappropriate mix of unit sizes and in the adequate open space in the in, 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 in inadequate open space provision for them. The modest is about 25 percent increase in employment space is not a benefit. It's more expensive than the existing accommodation use affordable workspace and the usability of the basement is seriously doubtful. It's not apparent that there will be any increase in employment for the operation of the proposed development. The council and the appellant had agreed a figure of 529 jobs in the proposed scheme. But Mr. Mark's evidence is that it could be as few as 316 jobs. That's a number which matches his potential open space figure of 1265 square meters. The application form says that there'll be 357 full-time equivalent employees in the scheme. Now, there are no overall figures for existing employment on site or the, num or the number of jobs in and around London, which are sustained by the studios. Home studios are 52 employees, of which whom 25 are full time. But there are no figures before you for those employed in the licensed units or how many could work in unit two if the appellant chose to let it out. Most importantly, though, the studios sustain a large number of workers who are based off site but who come to the studios for shoots or whose work relies on having the studios available. As I said, there are no heritage benefits. i turn a little bit to questions of viability. The appellant's excuse for failing to provide any affordable housing for sufficient family homes and sufficient commercial floor space is viability. It's not, I should emphasise, their excuse for the other deficiencies in the scheme. Viability is not a cheat code. A developer cannot excuse a substandard scheme because they say they cannot afford to build a better one. And the scheme's viability problems derive in large part from the high value of the current use of the site. The 2022 value, so the 2020 valuation shows a residual land value of 9.267 uh, million. Since the existing that's a residual value for the development scheme, of course. Uh, since the existing use value is 13.9 million, Mr. Turner of Savile's assessment for the appellant is that the landowners will be better off renting out the current buildings rather than redeveloping under the appeal scheme. Now, Stretton's valuation for the council shows a higher residual land value. They went for 16.3 million, which I have to say, which must be said is scarcely worth redevelopment from the landowner perspective but presumably that the appellant relies on its own experts the viability problems that the scheme has and which have been getting steadily worse uh, are another manifest of the appellant locking themselves into their plans of 10 or years ago there is though a viable scheme which contributes to london's cultural standing provides significant employment maintains the heritage assets and adds to the sociability and character of the area and complies with policy. That is the current Hoban Studios use. It should remain. This is not a site where substandard will do because something must be done with the land. Nothing needs to be done other than to keep hold of the jewel in London's cultural life, which we have. The other material considerations do not indicate that planning permission should be granted contrary to the development plan. The poor and compromised benefits and the significance of the harm caused all point away from consent. Uh, designated heritage assets, the scheme causes less than substantial harm to these. The harm to designated heritage, heritage assets has to be given great weight and requires a clear and convincing justification. I give the new paragraph references. There are no heritage benefits, and those claimed do not on any view outweigh the heritage harm caused. The extent of other public benefits depends on the overall quality and policy compliance of the claimed benefits, and so the harm caused by them. Now, a housing benefit which complied with the target for affordable housing and meets requirements such as mix and dual aspect is more likely to be a public benefit or be a public benefit with greater weight than housing development which is without affordable housing. 
In the present case, the public benefit of housing is diminished by its compromises. And the public benefits, madam, do not outweigh the harm to designated heritage assets. The scheme causes substantial harm to the Hope and Studio site as a non-designated heritage asset. And this goes into a simple balance within the framework. With the very limited benefits in this scheme, permissions should be refused on this test as well. Then the presumption in favour of sustainable development. The presumption in favour of sustainable development in paragraph 11 of the framework does not apply. In respect of paragraph 11c, the scheme is not in accordance with the development plan. And it's agreed that the tilted balance in paragraph 11d uh, not does not apply, notwithstanding Mr. White and Mr. Parkinson's late attempt to disagree with their own witness, Mr. Marks. So, Madam, for those reasons, the planning application uh, and appeal should be refused. Uh, Madam, uh, it's been a, uh, a long process for us all to have got to this point, but uh, those are the concluding submissions on behalf of Hogan Studios Limited, unless I can help any further. Thank you very much, Mr. Harwood. Okay, then it's now nearly 12 o'clock. Um, if we take a break, Mr. White is 20 minutes. Absolutely fine. Whatever, whatever is suitable oh, for you. Could I ask you please to send five minutes before we resume? Could you please send your closing through so, yes. that, so that I can um, print it out before we resume? Completely, yeah. Okay, um, so it's now nearly 12 o'clock. Uh, we'll come back again, uh, we'll resume again at 20 past, 20 past 12. Thank you very much, everyone.
Good afternoon, everyone. It's now um, 20 past 12. Thank you very much, Mr. White. I've received your opening. I'll take that as IQ 35. Um, whenever you're ready, please. Thank you very much, Mum. Um, before I go to the text, though, I do want to endorse Mr. Harwood's comments. And it is obviously important to say this is, I think we all acknowledge for reasons that are well rehearsed. It hasn't exactly been a conventional inquiry in terms of proceeding. But thank you on behalf of the appellants. And I know Mr. Howard said this in relation to the Rule 6. And I know Mr. Beard feels the same. But I think it is important for us all collectively to thank you for your flexibility and adaptability in what probably uh, various scenarios that certainly aren't in the um, inspector's manual of how to deal with it. So um, I, I think the fact that we have got here and hopefully, please God, are about to close the inquiry is testament to how you've dealt with it. So thank you on behalf of all three of us. Thank you. I was nervous adjourning. <laughs> Just yeah. when you gave your closing, Mr. White. Mm. <laughs> I know. Well, well, absolutely. Mr. Parkinson said the same thing to me. Um, about avoiding <laughs> avoiding any under any ladders except my way back you. in the chambers. Okay. Right. Okay, um, thank you. So could I start on the first page? And and as you can see, Mum, Mr. Parkinson and I have 13 sections. I'm going to ask Mr. Parkinson to read sections eight to ten out, just because frankly I think for everyone's benefit it's nice to have a bit of variety and also those are part of those are sections that he dealt with in, in evidence so i will i will indicate at what stage that is happening but i can i take the sections as read and i'll also take because i'll come to them the seven introductory points i seek to make on behalf of the appellant please um mom the first point i want to make an in introduction is that of course whatever has been said the fact is the grant of consent has been determined to be right for seven years as you know the first redevelopment of the site was proposed in 2015 since 2017 to the present five times during that period and this is important the key word is the planning judgment not in relation to legality or any other factor but the planning judgment of officers and members has been that planning permission should be granted and we say that material weight should and must be placed on those judgments which are highly pertinent to this appeal and provide frankly corroboration of the appellant's case the only reason we are here is because there are errors in law by the lpa relating to consultation and viability on those two previous applications but do not fall for the argument that has been rehearsed this morning that the court judgments fundamentally erode or disturb the overall planning judgment um, that planning permission should be granted for this proposal. Those numerous judgments by the LPA that overall the planning balance was in favour of grant is correct, frankly, um, when one considers the planning status of the site. Holborn Studios would have you believe that there have been material changes to the planning framework that is not accepted particularly in relation to the march 2022 planning officers report and frankly ma'am the simple point is the appellate's position is that planning permission should be granted is corroborated by those three planning officers judgments and the two committee decisions that planning permission should be granted the second point, and it is critically important, of course, is what has been identified by the development plan in relation to the site. And it's noteworthy, ma'am, if I can just make an aside, how little this is mentioned in both my learned friends' closing. But the fact is, we have a site which is, as it says in the tin, on the tin, the city fringe opportunity area and a Wenlock priority office area. And what, the, what is proposed is employment led. As you know, the development plan seeks to set out what it seeks for land during the plan period. It also benefits from a statutory presumption in its favour. It is, of course, important to remember the Strategic Planning Authority, the GLA and the LPA have free reign to decide what they think should happen to the site during the plan period and can propose that accordingly. Here, both the GLA and the LPA have decided in the strongest terms what should happen. And in terms of the London plan, 
the site is identified in the city fringe opportunity area. And we say it's critical because that identifies parts of London that will see significant development over the lifetime of the plan. Those areas will see the most significant change. And of course, these references, ma'am, are to the London plan, are identified as opportunity areas. And policy SD1 requires that boroughs set out how they will encourage and critically and, and deliver growth potential in the opportunity areas. So this site does lie within the central London opportunity area, which is identified as city fringe slash tech city, where the London plan seeks the provision during the plan period of 15,500 houses and 50,500 jobs. And we say that's obviously incredibly significant. And figure 211 of the London plan shows the site within that area. Consequently, the site is identified in an area that the strategic planning authority has identified as a major driver for development during the plan period. As Mr Callum accepted in his evidence, the development plan is enthusiastic about developments of this type in an opportunity area. And it's especially enthusiastic about higher density developments such as this coming forward on brownfield sites as articulated in GG2. That's also reflected in the Hackney local plan. As Mr Callum agreed, the Hackney local plan is a growth plan. It seeks to provide jobs, houses and new office floor space. Indeed, new office floor space of a quantum of 118,000 square metres through policy LP26. Again, policies LP26 and 27 in the local plan identify the site within a designated employment area, the Wenlock priority area. And there again, the local plan is very clear as to what should happen in those areas. New development in designated employment areas should maximise employment floor space. Office led development will be supported. New development will be permitted when it is employment led in the priority office areas as the most sustainable location for this type of development. Additionally, and it is noteworthy this ma'am, residential development is also permitted in the priority office areas where it is part of an employment led mixed use scheme. Therefore, Mr Callum was right to agree that the Hackney local plan supports and encourages mixed use development, including housing in this location. Therefore, we say what is proposed is completely in line with the overall development plan in bringing forward state of the art employment floor space, bringing forward state of the art residential development in an agreed employment led scheme, in a mixed use scheme, which brings about the maximization of employment floor space and uses underutilized land in the process. For that reason, Mum, we say importantly and unusually, the LPA take no issue in principle with the redevelopment of the site as confirmed by Mr. Callum's evidence. So the third point is the status quo cannot continue. It's common ground with the LPA that these buildings require upgrading and just as an aside, Mum, uh, of course, this point is completely undealt with by the Rule 6 party. The reality is these buildings need modernisation. They are not suitable for a wide range of occupiers. Additionally, the cost of upgrading the floor space for a wider occupation within use class EGI would not be economically viable. Consequently, that all leads to a correct conclusion. The status quo cannot continue. If the buildings cannot remain as they are currently and refurbishment is not viable, then the only solution needs to be a long term solution and that solution needs to be found soon. The position of Holborn Studios that nothing needs to happen on the site as put by Mr Harwood on Tuesday, that was obviously Tuesday of the week of evidence to Mr Marks is therefore we say academic and irrelevant. It is the luxury perspective of a leaseholder who has no need or concern to think about the buildings because they do not own them in any way. The simple point is the buildings need modernisation and it's not economically viable to do so. Therefore, the only credible future of the site is redevelopment, which is why the LPA have no objection in principle to this development. So then dealing with the harm, the fourth point is the exaggeration of the harm. We fundamentally say the harm has been greatly exaggerated by the case put by the LPA because the cultural facilities will be provided on site, but with more and better floor space. The living conditions of the proposed residents in the round will be excellent when all matters are considered. The heritage harm minor, though it is, 
will be outweighed by the heritage benefits, leading to a net heritage enhancement. And finally, the proposal will represent a material improvement in the provision of employment land, both qualitatively and quantitatively. Point five, we say there will be significant benefits which will be in line with the development plan and will happen. Of course, the planning system accepts and acknowledges planning benefits as it should do. We say, and it is right, the proposal will set out in great detail later on about the very significant benefits, which include investment, regeneration, new housing, development in what is agreed to be a sustainable location, development that can be accessed by alternative modes of transport, new improved floor space for employment in an opportunity area, new improved employment floor space in the Wenlock Priority Office area, and again, of course, finally, a mixed use scheme in the Wenlock Priority area, including residential. So putting those together, we say this is a proposal which meets the key aspirations of government policy. The government, as you know, in December 23, updated the MPPF, and we say the proposal accords with that because this is a proposal which provides economic growth and the NPPF is clear significant weight should be placed on that need. It's a mixed use development encouraged by power 124. It leads to optimization of the land, again, the same power. It's in a sustainable location in accordance with power 108. It can be accessed by alternative modes of transport in accordance with 116. It will boost the supply of housing, a key objective of national planning policy enshrined in power 60. And it will also improve employment provision and floor space in accordance with para 85. So putting those points together, there is also the, the jobs and investment. And one can often forget this, but as the Statement of Common Ground says at 8.29, the scheme will lead to 529 jobs. And just take a moment, Mum, to reflect on that quantum. 529 jobs agreed with the LPA. Additional economic benefits will be delivered through indirect employment residence spend, as well as delivering a quantitative increase in the quantum of commercial floor space at the site. The employment floor space will be developed to a high standard and modern specification, delivering a major qualitative enhancement. So can I just take a moment and, of course, through the fog and mist of this inquiry, one often has forgotten what this is actually, what the appellant is asking you to grant consent for. And I think these are all agreed now. In terms of employment, ma'am, there is an increase as set out there from 5035 to 5718, which is a net increase in quantity. And we say, and I think the LPA accept this quality. In housing, you have none across this site currently, not a single residential unit. What is proposed is 50 units. The cafe is effectively does reduce in size but there is still provision of a cafe in the future scheme. There is communal space and gardens, none at the moment. There's not a single communal space on site and there will be in the proposal. There will be pedestrian access to the canal through the site on the appellant's case and we completely reject what the rule six parties say about access in future. Parking spaces, 10 to 15 informal spaces in the courtyard you'll have seen, in the proposal, only three disabled blue badge spaces, accepted in the Statement of Common Ground to be a car-free development. Cycle parking provision, none currently provided, which probably amounts to leaning on the side of buildings. 228 formal spaces will be provided, which we say very significant. BNG, just recently off the, um, obviously now part of the requirements, but um, we have a 100% increase, which you say very significant improvements. So overall, what you have currently single use and what is proposed is mixed use in line, as we say, and as I've previously said, with policy. Then the matters of agreement, Mum, and I don't think there'll be there's much purpose reading those out because they're frankly not in dispute, as you can see, the statement of common ground. So what leaves us? Let's focus on the four issues that you really need to grapple with at this appeal. The first is obviously the effect on cultural facilities, the second on those living in the flats, the third, the heritage assets, the fourth, employment floor space. I do want to just say something about the approach of the parties, because particularly in the light of how strongly Mr Harwood has sought to attack the appellants, but we know, and you know, the appellant has been subject, particularly from his clients, to continuous needed criticisms for numerous years. We do not accept that my clients accept should merit any such criticism, frankly, 
They seek to and will invest millions in this site with the intention of upgrading and transforming it. They have evolved a scheme over many years with much discussion, which, of course, received much support from the officers. And as I've said, this is a scheme that evolves, completely complies with policy and will result in a huge investment in the site to the benefit of many. So can I deal with the first main issue in dispute, which is the provision of cultural facilities? And we've broken that down into five effectively questions for you, Mark. Of course, the policy requirements are encapsulated in HC5 of the London Plan and LP10 of the local plan. Both policies require detailed scrutiny. Dealing with HC5 first, it came into force in March 21 with the adoption of the London Plan and it seeks to support London's cultural and creative industries. It is of note, actually it's incredibly revealing, that the reason of refusal doesn't allege the policy is actually breached, but the, rather the proposal is contrary to the objectives of the policy. That is an implicit concession in our submission that the policy in itself doesn't seek to protect the cultural facilities themselves in a development management context. That is, of course, correct, because although it says that development proposals should protect existing cultural facilities, venues and uses, the policy explains how this protection will come about by putting the emphasis on boroughs, i.e. Hackney, to do three things. Develop an understanding of the existing critical offers in their areas. Secondly, evaluate what's unique or important to residents, workers and visitors. And thirdly, through the development of policies to protect those cultural uses, assets and spaces. The LPA have not complied with those first two elements. There's no evidence before the inquiry of any understanding of the existing cultural offer in their areas or an evaluation of what is important to residents. Therefore, the only relevant limb is the requirement to develop policies, and that leads to LP10, which we'll consider in a moment. Therefore, the allegation of breach of the objectives of HC5 is simply not correct. That allegation cannot be sustained on the wording of the policy because it says how the protection will be sought, and that leads to policy LP10. If the development complies with policy LP10, then it complies with the objectives of HC5. Further, in any event, the reference to protection in HC5 must plainly be read consistently with what is meant by policy LP10. That's for two reasons. As Mr. Marx explained, whilst technically adopted before the London plan, the local plan states that it was produced alongside that plan and helped to shape strategic elements of it. It would therefore be surprising if there was any inconsistency between the two policies. And secondly, if there was an HC5 sought enhanced protection over and above what's required by policy LP10, the latter policy would by default be out of date and all parties accept the opposite, that it's up to date. Therefore, the key policy for you to grapple with on this matter is a local plan policy LP10, which is concerned with cultural facilities. Mr. Callum agreed the only relevant criterion in the policy that you would need to consider is D, which states, and I set it out there, I'm sure it's engraved on your memory, Mom, so I won't read it out, but you can see what the gist of the policy gets to. We say the two key elements of the policy is that the loss of cultural facilities will be resisted unless they are re-provided. So resistance unless reprovision. In other words, as Mr. Callum accepted, if a cultural facility is reprovided, there cannot be conflict with policy. And then, of course, we want to make three points about what's meant by reprovided. Policy LP10 and indeed HC5 is concerned with existing cultural uses and offers no protection to a specific business occupying a site. That's clear from the policy wording itself. LP10 offers protection against the loss of arts, culture and entertainment facilities in the same way policy HC5 states that development should protect existing cultural venues, facilities and uses. The observations made by Mr Justice Dove in the, in the second judicial review challenge remain equally applicable to the policies in question here, that nowhere in any of the policies relied on by the claimant does the need to protect the specific and bespoke use operated by the claimant and its particular requirements in relation to accommodation arise. That's entirely consistent, as you know, Mum, with the entire rationale of the planning system, which is concerned with land use considerations and not the preferences of particular occupiers. 
the LPA's officers, who of course know the policy and its rationale well, considered in the planning officer's report that it sought to protect uses. Therefore, even if Holborn Studios chose to leave the site following the grant permission, this is irrelevant to the question of policy comp compliance, provided the same use was reprovided. Secondly, LP10 and of course HC5 is complied with where there is reprovision of facilities. There is understandably no requirement for the exact same cultural use to be provided for, not least because cultural floor space can change use from, say, a rehearsal space to an audio recording space without the need for planning permission. Third, the reference to facilities in the policy doesn't require like for like reprovision of exactly the same existing physical premises. For a start, there's no reference to like for like physical reprovision in the policy or indeed HC5. In any event, such an interpretation makes the policy entirely circular. If a development provides exactly the same premises as existed before, then there is no loss in the first place to reprovide. The policy therefore must be read sensibly and adopting a common sense interpretation. If a new building is provided that enables the cultural use to continue, then the facility has been reprovided. Let's now deal with what's actually there on site. And again, we seek to make three important points on the existing operation. The extensive cross-examination on Mr. Stevenson on whether or not Holborn Studios is a cultural use or not is completely sterile and academic because his evidence ultimately proceeded on the basis that it was. That said, Holborn students have been very reticent to provide information as to what actually happens on site and remarkably it emerged for the very first time in the oral evidence of Billy McCartney. Whatever is contended by Holborn Studios, there are clearly occupiers who have no cultural element that I recognise, frankly, like an osteopath, osteopath. To allege that these uses are ancillary to Holborn Studios, as was done, is simply not credible. Secondly, the model of Holborn Studios is not unique and can be replicated, as confirmed in the evidence of Billy McCartney, that Spring Studios have copied the HS model. Third, in any event, to the extent that Holborn Studios is special, that's nothing to do with the actual buildings on the site. Holborn Studios have historically operated from three different premises, none of which were custom built or designed for photographic studios. As the McCartney family were keen to emphasise, what makes Holborn Studios so successful is the bespoke service provided from the second you arrive. That service and the history associated with the Holborn Studios brand can be provided from whenever Holborn Studios operates in the future, be it within the new development or in alternative premises, as they have done so in the past. Holborn Studios frankly recognised all of this in, in past, as Mr Hol Stevenson explains, in 2009 when they were involved in a development proposal that Mr Stevenson appended to his evidence that sought the demol demolition of the existing buildings on the site. There's nothing unique or special about the buildings themselves, as Mr Stevenson's appendices 8 and 9 show, photographic studios operate out of a wide range of premises. So the third question is what will happen on the site in future? It's common ground with the council that the scheme will provide a significant quantum of new cultural floor space. The basement provides nearly a thousand metres of floor space accepted to be capable Sorry, of... Mr. White. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, Mr. White, you lost connection there. Oh, sorry. But just if you just go back a, a paragraph. Yes, I was just, I'm at paragraph 32.1. 32.1, if you start that paragraph again. Uh, absolutely, ma'am. The basement provides nearly a thousand metres of floor space accepted to be capable of being used by cultural occupiers, but also an attractive space for such users given its high ceilings at basement level, lack of columns and a large goods lift. The council accepts in the statement of common ground that new floor space would be and note the word, ma'am, agreed by the council would be attractive to a number of cultural uses and has been designed to be suitable for cultural industries. Ms. Musari specifically confirmed that this was recorded in the Statement of Common Ground, also reflected her evidence. As explained by Mr. Stevenson, as well as use by photographic and film studios, this would all include potential uses as a rehearsal space, dance studio, exhibition space, and as an audio recording spaces. The suggestion by Holborn Studios, but notably not the LPA, that these uses would not fall within class EGI, is academic in circumstances where the suggested revised condition 
41 would permit any use within class eg i.e uses which would be carried out in a residential area without detriment to its amenity that would plainly include the above uses therefore once the permission is implemented by the commencement of the e-class eg use in part of the proposal a cultural eg use could take place in the proposed cultural floor space the ground and first floor also provide much additional floor space and there's simply no reason why it cannot be used in conjunction with the basement in the same way that some existing office space at the site is used in conjunction with the main studios either by one tenant or the space could be split up and used by a number of occupiers to the extent that the existing site is a creative hub that hub could be reprovided as part of the new development additionally 11.5 percent of the floor space proposed will be subject to the affordable housing requirements which will ensure for the first time that formal reduced rent provisions are in play therefore we say and we do close absolutely the whole of the employment floor space could be used for cultural facilities therefore the starting point is that regardless of the suitability of the new floor space for a photography studio policy lp10 is clearly complied with because the new space is clearly suitable for cultural use indeed even holborn studios don't put forward a positive case that the new floor space was not suitable for occupation by cultural use this evidence was focused very much on its suitability as a photographic studio for holborn studios in any event even if the policies require the exact same cultural use to be provided we say this is read this is delivered by the scheme as again common ground with the lpa new spaces are suitable for occupation by a photographic studio the statement of common ground records in terms that the new space could be occupied by film and photographic studios this was also the independent conclusion reached by he helen arva Nitakis, a consultant to the creative industries, and Phil Davis of DDC, both of whom are experienced in the requirements of modern photographic studios. Indeed, the limited extent of the complaints made by Holborn Studios served little more than to demonstrate that the space could easily be used as a studio. The criticism made of lack of natural light really goes nowhere when a Holborn clearly operated from a basement for some years. There is no natural light in the corridors at Holborn Studios apart from the one right next to the reception. There's natural daylight into the proposed basement in the scheme from the staircase down the from the internal courtyard. There's only natural light studio at present, one natural light presently. Not only was the, the out of operation for some time, uh, demonstrating its limited importance, we say to HSS's operation, but it's not DDA compliant in any event. We say there's no reason why a studio with natural light could not be provided at ground floor level anyway in the development if it was considered important. Then we've got the various criticisms made of the internal layout, but completely failed to grasp that this is a scheme that at Reba stage three, as Mr. Davy explained, the configuration of the internal floor space, including the location of any load bearing walls and coves could all be changed. And in reality would be changed to reflect the requirements of a particular occupier. If required, the design could facilitate a need to segregate visitors to the studio, for example, a Love Island style shoot. Further, while considerably considerable time was taken at the inquiry in discussing ceiling heights in the basement and the need for sufficient space for ventilation, etc., Mr. Davy explained this could all easily be accommodated by power floating the top of the slab as the only qualified architect to give evidence. His evidence was that this could be straightforward and it should be given considerable weight. Ultimately, while Holborn Studios have complained about the indicative layouts on points of detail, there's no evidence before the inquiry that a suitable internal studio layout could not be achieved at Reba Stage 3 to meet the particular requirements of the final end user. Then dealing with loading and unloading, we say it could be accommodated through the goods lift because there's nothing unusual or impractical about this. Not only did Holborn Studios operate um, with a lift for a number of years, but a number of the studios referred to Mr. Stevenson's evidence are accessed by a lift, including studios and the successful Spring Studios development. The potential scenario of the lift breaking down is overblown in circumstances where, of course, it's a remote risk and is common to any development predominantly served by a lift. It cannot be a legitimate basis to refuse permission. And secondly, even in that doomsday scenario, there is alternative goods access to the basement at any event via the courtyard staircase. 
The fact that Holman Studios' complaints about the detailed design are so limited, frankly, with many points being raised for the first time at the inquiry, we say is a reflection of the careful thought given by Mr Davy to the internal design of the potential studio space following engagement with HS at the outset of the proposals. Ultimately, whether a photographic studio or different cultural use, the existing cultural facilities on the site will be reprovided. Then the fourth issue is what will happen to Holborn Studios and the associated uses if planning permission is granted. Mum, the cultural facility is reprovided and therefore, if minded to, there is no reason whatsoever why Holborn Studios could not continue to operate from Eagle Wharf. However, if they chose not to, it's no part of Holborn Studios' case, and this is really important, Mum, to allege that the effect of granting planning permission here would in any way end its business. Not only that, but Billy McCartney specifically accepted that it was no part of his evidence to suggest Holborn Studios would not be able to find alternative premises. He was right to make that concession, because even though Holborn Studios had been aware of the potential redevelopment for over nine years, it's never instructed an agent to look for alternative premises. However, Mr Stevenson's undisputed evidence shows there's a very good supply of existing floor space potentially suitable for Holborn Studios including 83,000 square metres of industrial floor space in Hackney, Islington and Camden, and therefore an inner London location comparative to the existing site. As Mr Stevenson explained, that would include many warehouse type developments with high ceilings and of similar character to Eagle Wharf. On the McCartney's own evidence to you, Mum, business is good and in any event it would receive a considerable amount of compensation if the development took place. As Mr Stevenson explained, even having regard to its rent liability, this would place it in a strong position to negotiate terms on a replacement premises. And that concession is of vital importance. For all the inquiry time spent debating whether or not Holborn Studios could move into replacement floor space on the site, ultimately this is largely academic in circumstances where there's no dispute that Holborn Studios could find alternate space. In no sense at all would Holborn Studios as a cultural facility be lost. So lastly, will there be harm when one considers the policy, the current position, the future? And mom, however this issue is analysed, there is policy compliance, no harm whatsoever. Obviously, HC5 and LP10 should be read consistently with one another. They are complied with if the existing cultural facility on site is reprovided. However, this is interpreted. We say the policy is complied with because it's common ground with the council that the new floor space will be suitable for a range of cultural uses and even if Holborn Studios contend otherwise. If the policy requires the reprovision of a photographic studio on the site, the scheme does this. This is effectively conceded by the LPN, the statement of common ground and Holborn Studios complaints about the new space are exaggerated. If contrary to the approach of Mr Justice Dove, the policies are somehow interpreted as requiring the specific cultural business that currently operates from the site is not lost, then there's also policy compliance because it's no part of the Holborn Studios case to allege they will be closed and it's not in dispute that Holborn Studios can operate from alternative premises. There's no allegation that if planning permission is granted that any of the other cultural uses in the building will close or could not find alternative space. There would not be any loss to any of the occupiers save the effort of finding alternate space which is addressed through the payment of compensation under the landlord and tenant regime, not through the planning system. Therefore, Mum, on any basis, the allegation of harm is simply not made out. The scheme is wholly policy compliant in this respect. Further, to the extent that the question of policy compliance boils down to a matter of policy interpretation, ultimately a matter of law that can only be resolved in the High Court, it's not necessary to resolve this interpretation issue in order to find in favour of the appellant. That is because even on the LPA, Holman Studios interpretation is accepted, e.g. there must be like for like physical reprovision, and it's found that these policies are breached. It's then necessary to consider the extent of breach in order to weigh the harm into the balance. Here, on any analysis, any harm that flows is minimal in light of Holman Studios' acceptance that they can find alternative premises. Therefore, even um, if the LPP and the Holborn Studios interpretation accepted, it would be open to you to find as a matter of planning judgment that the conflict with policy should be given limited weight and the scheme would be complied with um, the development plan taken as a whole. 
Now, ma'am, you'll be pleased to hear some variety in voice. I'll now introduce Mr. Parkinson and he'll take over at section eight. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Um, yes, we, we turn next to the question of whether there would be harm to heritage assets if planning permission is granted. And we say the scheme does not cause any harm to the various heritage assets in dispute. To the contrary, it would have a net beneficial effect on the non-designated heritage asset comprising the site and consequently on the Regent's Canal conservation area. Four important contextual points should be noted at the outset. First, this is a development that is, quote, welcomed and supported overall by Historic England. Historic England has significant knowledge of the site and visited it with Dr. Mealy during pre-app to advise on the heritage design approach for the application. Notably, despite agreeing that Historic England's views ought to be given considerable weight, both Mr. Dyer and Mr. Murphy failed to draw this important support to your attention during their evidence. Second, on all three occasions that the scheme has been recommended for approval by officers, it was concluded that the heritage impacts were acceptable following a comprehensive assessment of the impacts of the proposals. For the 2017 application, it was concluded that the significance of the conservation area was, quote, preserved once the beneficial aspects of the scheme were considered. And for the 2015 application, the conclusion was reached that the conservation area was, quote, enhanced overall. Third, on two of these occasions, members agreed with the advice from officers. Mr. Dyer confirmed that there had been no material change in heritage circumstances since this application was first recommended for approval in 2016, and that his evidence did not explain why members reached a different conclusion on the third occasion. Fourth, the scheme evolved and was discussed with the relevant stakeholders considering their views. The scheme was not presented as a fait accompli, but had the input and guidance of relevant heritage officers. That is, we say, noteworthy and reflects the retention and enhancement of the most important elements of historic in interest found on the site. So we turn first to the impact on the non-designated heritage asset and firstly, significance. The significance of the NDHA is set out in the local listing report. It's common ground that the significance varies across the site and that the buildings of most architectural interest are the two Hoskins and Sewell ranges dating from somewhere between 1871 and 1891, and the chimney dating from the early 1900s. It's these buildings which, quote, tell the story of the early development of the, the Regent's Canal, and that's a quote from the, the local listing report. The other buildings have a utilitarian appearance and have been heavily altered, eroding their character. Whilst they have some value in telling the story of the evolution of the site, overall they're of low architectural interest, Mr. Murphy recognised that the architectural interest in the site was, quote, modest. As for the site's historic interest, Mr. Dyer accepted that the current use as a photographic studio was not one of the primary reasons for its local listing. There's also simply no basis for concluding that the use is of possible international significance, as alleged by Mr. Murphy. Not only is this inconsistent with Historic England's decision not to list the site, as he accepted, but there's also no independent objective evidence to confirm this suggestion. Any historical interest derived from the use is local. Further, as Dr. Mealy explained, the site's historical association with Holborn Studios will continue post-development, regardless of whether or not it remains in situ, in the same way that there continues to be a historical association with Bristol. That's particularly the case here when there's nothing in the permanent form of the buildings which reflects its use and any internal adaptations can be removed without the need for planning permission. As such, whatever contribution the current use makes to significance, this will be unchanged following the development. Indeed, this point was effectively conceded by Mr. Murphy, who accepted that Dr. Mealy's building I, which contains the majority of the studios, could be demolished and replaced with a well-designed new building without harming the significance of the NDHA. Turning next to the impact of the development, crucially, the development would preserve the buildings of most significance on the site, as found by Historic England and accepted by both Mr Murphy and Mr Dyer. The council's suggestion in its written evidence that the scheme would result in the total loss of the historic architectural and environmental significance of the locally listed building is fundamentally incompatible with this concession. As for the new build element, it's common ground with the council that the new buildings are of the highest architectural and urban design quality, respond well to their local character and context, use attractive high quality materials which complement the character of the retained heritage assets, that the scale of development is appropriate to the setting of the retained assets, that the chimney would continue to be a landmark feature on the site. 
In short, not only are the build most significance retained, but their character and significance is enhanced through sensitive and well-designed new development. As such, the significance of the NDHA and its legibility would be largely unaffected. The buildings retained would continue to tell the story of the early development of the Regent's Canal as they do currently. Further, as Dr. Mealy explained, the plan form of the proposal respects the historic pattern of development with two separate courtyards reflecting the evolution of the site over time. All this is, we say, no coincidence. The design of the scheme was heavily influenced not only by advice from Historic England, but also from Mr. Payne, who worked within the conservation team at the council and who was the author of the local listing report, and therefore more than anyone knows what elements of the NDHA are of most importance. That said, as Dr. Mealy fairly recognises, the removal of some of the later buildings does result in a low level of harm to the significance of the NDHA. However, this harm is more than offset by the heritage benefits that the scheme would deliver. These benefits are numerous and include, first, the removal of detracting elements. The removal of the 20th century lean-to extension to Building 1 will allow the canal facade to be appreciated as it was originally built in the 19th century, recognised as being a benefit by HE. Further, the courtyard facade of Buildings 1 and 2 has been painted and is cluttered with external staircases and aircon units, detracting from the ability to appreciate these buildings. The removal of these elements will further improve the ability to appreciate these buildings in their historic context of the canal. Second, restoration of the retained buildings. Buildings one and two will be repaired and renovated, including the roof, which is currently clad in modern and unattractive tiles and windows. Third, new views of the chimney. The buildings surrounding the bottom third of the chimney are later additions which do not relate to its original function. They would be removed, revealing the full vertical extent of the chimney, which, as explained by Dr. Mealy, was originally designed to be freestanding. The visual prominence of the chimney from the canal will be increased. Further, there are currently no views of the chimney from within the site, and the development will provide such a view for the first time. Fourth benefit would be improved public access towards the canal through the provision of an enlarged area of open space around the canal and the chimney, which will ensure that the heritage value of the NDHA is better revealed to use the language of Historic England setting guidance. Further, public access towards the canal will be improved with new and enhanced access from Eagle Wharf Road. And fifth and finally, the maintenance of the chimney. The chimney is 125 years old and no one, including the current occupier, has undertaken any significant repairs. The repair and future maintenance of the chimney was a benefit which was rightly given significant weight by officers and was seen as sufficient in of itself to outweigh any harm from the proposals. Apart from the last benefit, Mr Dyer did not give any weight to any of these benefits. Mr Murphy appears to see nothing positive in the scheme at all. Their overall assessment is accordingly seriously unbalanced and should be given very little weight. Then turning to the impact on the conservation area, starting with significance. The significance of the conservation area is largely a matter of agreement. It's described in the conservation area appraisal as being a well-used public space with an important environmental landscape and represents a unique industrial heritage both along the canal, including the locks, bridges, the moorings and the industrial buildings besides the canal and in the canal basins. Both Mr Dyer and Mr Murphy contend that the scheme would result in a moderate level of less than substantial harm to the conservation area i.e. that the development would come halfway to seriously affecting a key element of the significance of the conservation area, actual harm to the conservation area, i.e. that the development would come halfway to seriously affecting a key element of the significance of the conservation area. That conclusion is, we say, simply untenable for the following reasons. First, the correct frame of reference is to consider the impact of the proposal on the conservation area taken as a whole, and that approach is set out in paragraph 213 of the MPPF. The conservation area runs for almost four kilometres across the southern part of the borough, and any impact is localised to the site itself and the towpath uh, directly adjacent to it. Second, the proposals do not directly impact on the canal, and therefore have no impact at all on the key historic and heritage feature in the conservation area. Third, the only element of the significance of the conservation area that Mr Dyer considered would be harmed would be from the loss of industrial buildings besides the canal. And in this respect, it was said that the site represented one of the last surviving industrial buildings in, quote, a semblance of industrial use. However, first, it's common ground that there are a number of former industrial 
buildings in the conservation area. And the site does not fall within the stretch that, quote, from the appraisal, more than any other section of the canal, demonstrates its formerly industrial nature. Second, and in any event, the development will continue to reference the former industrial use of the conservation area through the retained chimney and buildings. The conservation area appraisal distinguishes between industrial buildings of good quality, seen as a strength, and those of poor quality, seen as a weakness. The scheme would retain the former and remove the latter. In any event, the Eagle Wharf Road frontage makes a limited contribution to the character and appearance of the conservation area, and the removal of the buildings fronting onto the road will have no material impact on the significance of the conservation area taken as a whole. Further, the site's not in a semi-industrial use. There's no obvious connection between the photographic studio use and the canal's industrial history, and nor is one identified in the conservation area appraisal. Further, despite noting the number of creative studios along the canal, the conservation area appraisal does not list as one of its does not list this as one of its most positive features of the conservation area. And finally, in any event, both Mr. Dyer and Mr. Murphy seem to have lost sight of the fact that this is an employment-led proposal, which results in an increase in the amount of employment floor space. Therefore, to the extent that this, the employment uses along the canal contribute to its significance, the proposals will enhance the conservation area, as Mr. Murphy accepted, albeit, he said, only in a, a technical sense. Finally, it's common ground with the Council that the key view towards the site from the Regents Canal identified in the conservation area appraisal would be unharmed. Given all this, the evidence of Dr Mealy was by far the most balanced. He recognised that the demolition of part of the NDHA would, considered in isolation, result in a low level of less than substantial harm to the conservation area, but this again was more than outweighed by the heritage benefits of the proposal. We've already set these benefits out above and, and don't repeat them, but to the extent that they're benefits to the NDHA, they also benefit the conservation area. And in doing so, the development would accord with a number of opportunities and address a number of the weaknesses identified in the conservation area appraisal. These include the repair and reuse of historic buildings for mixed and residential use, which is seen as an opportunity, the introduction of new residential developments that respect the scale and massing in both height and massing of the buildings historically seen on the canal, which the conservation area appraisal encourages, the introduction of more restaurants, something which is again encouraged, the creation of new ground floor active uses seen as a current weakness of the conservation area, and the creation of a new and enhanced pedestrian access through the site to the canal from Eagle Wharf Road, which would accord with the aspirations of the conservation area appraisal to ensure that the canal is a well-used public space. Overall, the effect of the scheme would be to enhance the conservation area. This is a benefit to which great weight must be given in accordance with paragraph 205 of the MPPF. Even if this is wrong, the scheme will cause only a limited level of less than substantial harm to the conservation area and indeed the NDHA. That harm would engage MPPF paragraph 208 in respect of the conservation area and paragraph 209 in respect of the NDHA. However, neither paragraph would provide a reason for refusing planning permission because in respect to paragraph 208, the public benefits of the proposal that we set out below outweigh the limited harm, and so too in respect to paragraph 209 in the unweighted balance. On this basis, there would also be compliance with policy LP3 of the Hackney Local Plan, which incorporates those balancing exercises. Finally, it's necessary to deal with the other assets that Mr Murphy alleges are harmed by the scheme, and we, we address these very briefly, since no harm to these assets has been found by the Council as local planning authority, the London Borough of Islington, within which the Arlington Square Conservation Area sits, or Historic England. Indeed, in the seven years that this scheme has been considered, Mr Murphy confirmed that he's the only heritage professional to have found harm of any degree to these assets. And there's a good reason for that. Taking them very briefly in turn, Shepherders Walk, Mr Murphy agreed that the applicant's uh, appellant's heritage impact assessment accurately sets out the key elements of significance and that these elements would be unaffected by the scheme. The scheme does not contribute to the significance of the terrace at all as it's around the corner from the buildings. However, the, rather the interest in the terrace is appreciated from the north looking to the south or from directly opposite the terrace. In any event, to the extent that the site did once contribute to the significance of the terrace, it's agreed that the original context of these buildings has already been fundamentally changed. In terms of the Arlington Square conservation area, as Dr Mealy explained, the buildings within the Arlington Square conservation area are inwards looking and therefore do not derive any of their significance from views out. 
In any event, it's agreed that there were no clear views of the appeal site from Arlington Avenue or Arlington Square itself. However, any views outwards from the conservation area and to an already very changed landscape and townscape, which to the south includes Angel Wharf immediately adjacent to the west of the site and the access storage building soon to be developed in a very similar nature to the scheme. And then finally, in terms of the locally listed buildings on Cropley Street, there's no material intervisibility between the site and these buildings which do not orient towards the site. The site makes no contribution whatsoever to the ability to appreciate the architectural or historic interest in these buildings. The allegation of harm to these assets is, we say, regrettable and should never have been made. The suggestion of a moderate level of less than substantial harm to these assets, i.e. halfway towards eliminating all of the significance of these assets, also casts serious doubt on the credibility of Mr Murphy's overall judgments. So we turn next to the um, next main issue, whether there'll be harm to the proposed residents' living conditions. And starting off with um, introductory points, and there's two points to, to make by way of introduction. First, there's absolutely no allegation of harm to any existing resident, which obviously is so important for an inner London redevelopment site. Mr. Canham accepted that not one resident in the vicinity of the site will be subject to any harm to their amenity if planning permission is granted. Second, the allegation relates solely to new occupiers who chose to live in the development. But it's important to note that the harm alleged, even on the council's case, only relates to a tiny element of the factors that affect residential amenity. Importantly, it's accepted that the usual metrics for assessing residential amenity, privacy, noise, air quality, overlooking, daylight, sunlight, space standards, private amenity space or design, are all complied with, and that this needs to be considered when reaching an overall judgment. So turning next to whether the amount of single aspect flats is harmful. The only allegation relates to the 54% of units that are single aspect or a total of 27 flats. When the relevant policies are considered, it's clear that the provision of single aspects flats is entirely policy compliant. Policy LP17 of the Hackney Local Plan requires compliance with, amongst other things, London Plan Policy on Design. London Plan Policy D6 then requires development to maximise the provision of dual aspect dwellings. Single aspect dwellings should normally be avoided, but can be provided where they're one, necessary to optimise site capacity through a design-led approach, and two, where adequate levels of amenity are provided. The approach of the LPA is to allege harm simply on the basis of the number of single aspect units in the development. However, the development plan does not set out any numerical threshold for the number of single aspect units, but rather just an aspiration to maximise the provision of dual aspect units, i.e. provide as many as possible. The number of dual aspect units that can be acceptably provided pursuant to that aspiration will be highly fact and site uh, specific. Here, Mr Davey explained in detail how the design process sought to maximise the number of dual aspect units having regard to the unique design constraints and opportunities of the site. Mr Davey has extensive experience developing high quality schemes in this area and worked intensively with the council, the design review panel and external stakeholders to develop this scheme since 2014. As he explained, at no point prior to the refusal were the concerns raised in reason for refusal too mentioned by the LPA or indeed by ICINI on behalf of Holborn Studios. The clear view of officers was that the proposal has, quote, maximised the number of dual aspect dwellings. This is obviously important because, as Mr Callum accepted, there was no reason to change the scheme if not a single person had raised a concern. Mr Davey explained that the number of dual aspect units had been maximised in accordance with policy. In particular, the number of dual aspect units could not have been increased because that would risk sterilising the potential for developing the Sturt Yard scheme and or would have had an unacceptable impact on the heritage assets that could be retained. He was not challenged on that evidence, either in cross-examination or in the LPA's evidence before the inquiry. Importantly, it was no part of either the LPA or Holton Studio's evidence to demonstrate how more dual aspect units could be provided. Given the policy context set out above, that is, we say, fatal to the Council's defence of this part of the reason for refusal. In terms of the evidence, there's effectively no dispute that the number of dual aspect units has been maximised. 
the sole basis on which Mr. Davies' evidence was challenged was on the grounds that he previously considered that four units, B4, 8, 15, and 21, were dual aspect units. Whereas following the publication in June 2023 of the London Plan Guidance on Housing Design Standards, those units are properly now to be classed as single aspect. However, this criticism goes nowhere at all since the constraints of the site remain unchanged and therefore, however dual aspect units are defined, there remains no way to increase the number of dual aspect units at the site still further. Further, the resultant levels of amenity in the single aspect units are, we say, more than adequate. First, very few of the single aspect dwellings, indeed just three, are north facing. Therefore, 24 of the single unit flats will receive direct sunlight. Of the three, two of them have lovely views over the canal, a view which is clearly delightful. No statutory or council consultee objected to the scheme on the grounds that the level of amenity in the single aspect units was not adequate. And it's common ground that the levels of privacy, daylight and sunlight and overheating in the single aspect units are all acceptable. All residential units would have private amenity space in the form of terraces or balconies, and the scheme complies with the LPG. Indeed, the only harm that Mr Callum could identify related to flexibility in using the internal space. A flimsy basis, we say, to find amenity is unacceptable when all the usual metrics are more than complied with and when all units meet the design standards of the London plan. And then finally, the number of single aspect units at the adjacent Sturch Yard development are higher than on the site, 61% single aspect on a much larger scheme. The council has failed to explain why that provision is acceptable, but not on this site. Next, the um, open space provision. Um, and again, the requirements of policy have all but been ignored by the LPA and Holborn Studios. The policy relevant to this issue is policy LP48, which isn't even referenced in the council's reason for refusal. Policy LP48 requires that on-site provision of open space should be, quote, maximised. Quantum targets are provided in parts A and B, but these are not requirements. They are to be provided where flexible, where feasible, sorry. As Mr Callum accepted, part C of the policy specifically recognises that there will be scenarios where parts A and B can be departed from. Therefore, as one would expect, policy LP48 is inherently flexible and sensitive to site-specific constraints. These policy requirements are met here. First, as Mr Davey explained, the on-site provision of open space has been maximised and it would not be feasible to meet the numerical targets in part A and B of the policy, having regard to the balance of employment and residential uses on the site. That remains the case even if the targets in part A and B are considered cumulatively, and therefore the debate about whether this is the correct interpretation of the policies is ultimately sterile. Second, again, that evidence was not challenged either in cross-examination or through the evidence of Mr Callum. And third, that reflects the position taken by officers when determining the application. As it was put in the officer's report, given the constrained nature of the site and the need to preserve some non-designated heritage assets, as well as the high quality nature of the space provided, most of which has an open aspect onto, onto the canal, the overall provision is considered acceptable. As Mr Callum accepted, at no point before the refusal by members was a concern raised about the level of open space. Further, the technical shortfall against the aspirations of Part A of the policy had been accepted by members on two previous occasions. The council has not even attempted to explain why the same quantum of open space that it previously found acceptable is now unacceptable. Its position is both completely inconsistent and in inexplicable. In any event, the exception in Part C of the policy is clearly engaged here. That's because the development makes physical improvements to the public realm to improve access to existing public open spaces. In particular, the scheme makes public realm improvements adjacent to the towpath, path, improving its setting and usability. And the development also makes financial contributions towards the enhancement of existing public open space, since the financial contribution towards the towpath is provided. Mr Callum accepted that both parts of uh, both elements of Part C of the policy were complied with. His complaint was that Parts A and B were not met. However, this is fundamentally the wrong way to approach the policy, since the figures in Parts A and B are only to be met where feasible, and there's therefore no breach of these parts. And in any event, where this is not feasible, the policy read as a whole is clearly complied with where Part C is met. After all, that's the whole point of including Part C within the policy. 
The reality is, as was recognised by officers in the officers' report, the new open space is a benefit of the proposal. It is, as found by officers of high quality, generous for an inner London development, would complement and support the proposed uses and increase the biodiversity and ecology on site. Even now, the LPA accepts all of this to be true, since there's no allegation that Part D of the policy, which relates to the quality of on-site provision, is breached. And then finally, is the children's play space provision harmful? The starting point for considering this complaint is that the development only just triggers the need to provide dedicated play space. Policy LP50 relates to the developments that are likely to generate a child yield of 10 or more. And the child year here is 10.2, so only just over the threshold. However, importantly, the policy recognises that its on-site targets may not be feasible in all cases. The supporting text of the policy is clear that on some sites this level of provision cannot be delivered in addition to the on-site communal open space. Um, Madam, we set out there paragraph 11.20, but I, I won't read this out. Yeah, yeah. This important policy caveat has been completely ignored by the LPA and Holborn Studios. This employment-led scheme with a need to balance a number of competing design and heritage requirements is one such case where it would be impossible to provide dedicated play space in addition to the communal open space. This approach was discussed and agreed by officers. In accordance with paragraph 11.20, the scheme provides for doorstop play for children aged up to five on site, and for older children, off-site play is provided for in local play areas in accordance with the council's SPD with Shepherders Walk Park being less than a five minute walk away. The LPA has effectively accepted that since no contribution is sought towards off-site play improvement. Importantly, it's no part of the LPA's evidence or indeed that of Holborn Studios to contend that the scheme could have been designed to provide for additional children's play space. So overall, we say yet again, the provision has been maximised on this employment-led scheme and there's no evidence to the contrary. The LPA has been forced to ignore the flexibility inherent in its own policies in order to defend this reason for refusal. And both officers and members have previously found that the provision of children's play space was acceptable, and the LPA has not even attempted to explain what's changed to mean that the scheme is now unacceptable in this regard. Turning next to whether there'll be harm to the provision of family housing in Hackney if planning permission was granted. The council alleges a breach of policy LP14. However, that policy is not prescriptive about the dwelling mix for market housing. The mix set out in part A of the policy is described as a preferred mix, and that includes 33% three plus bedroom units. However, part C of the policy is explicit that variations are permitted, having regard to a range of factors, including the site's location, area characteristics, design constraints, and scheme viability. And that's clearly of absolutely fundamental importance. The policy adopts a flexible approach having regard to site-specific circumstances. That's clear not only from the policy wording itself, but also reflects the LPA's approach on other sites. The LPA has consistently approved developments with a material shortfall against the preferred target for family units, including on the Sturts Yard site next door, which delivers only 5.5% three plus bed units, significantly below that provided here. Once the factors in Part C are considered as required by policy, the housing mix here is self-evidently acceptable and we briefly deal with the criteria set out in the policy. In terms of the location and area characteristics, on this site located in the Wenlock POA, employment development is clearly the priority land use. That impacts on the level and nature of residential accommodation that can be provided, a key consideration which has been ignored by the LPA. In any event, this is an urban location where there's a need to optimise site capacity and the surrounding developments are predominantly flatted. In terms of design constraints as an employment-led scheme, residential units are by necessity on the upper floors, which are less suitable for family housing. The nature of the retained heritage assets is also a constraint, since the retained warehouse is not suitable for conversion to larger family units. And then importantly, in terms of viability, as Mr Turner explained, the new and improved employment floor space delivered in line with the LPA's strategic priorities simply could not be provided with a greater number of three bedroom units. 
his evidence was clear and the uncontested viability appraisal demonstrates that providing additional family size units above the 20% proposed would result in either less affordable workspace being provided or a smaller affordable housing contribution. In order to maximize the amount of employment floor space in accordance with policy, it's been necessary to increase the proportion of one and two bedroom units providing more three, three plus bedroom units would render the scheme unviable. In this respect, the suggestion by Holborn Studios that viability has been relied on as a, an excuse, as was put by Mr. Turner in cross-examination, is profoundly contrary to both national and local policy, which specifically requires viability to be taken into account when formulating policy and assessing development proposals. Overall, taking these factors into account, there are clear reasons for not providing 33% three bedroom units on this site. In particular, the LPA and Holpen Studios have simply closed their eyes to the economic realities of delivering on the policy aspirations for an employment led development on this site and what this means for the housing mix that must come forward. All of this was recognised by the LPA previously. The scheme has been subject to extensive discussions with the council and the resultant mix is the result of that previous engagement. It's never been the subject of criticism before now. The LPA's officers have agreed with the appellant's mix on three separate occasions and that judgment has twice been endorsed by members. Therefore, yet again, to justify refusing this scheme, members have had to ignore their own policy requirements and act inconsistently with their previous decisions both on this site and elsewhere in the borough. And finally, the appellant is at a loss to understand what actual harm would be caused if the mix of housing in this development is approved. There's simply no identification of the harm that would accrue if planning permission is granted with the proposed housing mix. Indeed, the 2015 SHMA, which appears to be the most up to date, finds that there's a need for a range of housing unit sizes. And then I'll pass back to, to Mr White to pick up at section 11. Thank you, Mr Parkinson. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Parkinson. Yes, ma'am, if I could um, conclude at section 11 and I'll read the rest of the closing. Um, and the next issue is, of course, the, the fourth and main issue, which is employment floor space and whether there'd be harm to its provision if planning permission was granted. And we say that the position of the council and Holborn Studios case on this issue is fatally undermined by three key points. The council have not contested the appellant's viability evidence, which fixes the various components of the floor space. Secondly, all the part policies that are cited in the reason of refusal allow viability to influence the approach and application of the policies that are cited. And thirdly, given the cross-examination of Mr Callum, it's now common ground with the LPA that all of the policies cited are complied with by the proposal. Therefore, this is a reason for refusal that has no support from the development plan whatsoever. In fact, the development plan supports the mix of uses put forward. So dealing with the allegations of harm in turn, firstly, bizarrely, the reason of refusal appears to allege harm from the fact that the scheme delivers affordable housing in excess of 10%. This is impossible to understand because, of course, what you have here is effectively, sorry, let me just, um, what you have is in essence um, requires the policy LP29 requires that major employment development in a in a priority office area should provide affordable low cost workspace equating to a minimum of ten percent gross new employment floor space. So of course the requirement is a is a floor, not a ceiling. Indeed, notwithstanding the suggestion and the reason of refusal that policy L29 is breached, it's now accepted that the proposal meets and exceeds the policy requirement. As Mr Callum accepted, the in terms, the policy isn't actually breached, and it was agreed that the affordable workspace provision did not breach any other policy in the plan. Therefore, the fact the scheme provides more than 10% is a benefit of the proposal, not a harm. And since the aspiration of the local plan is to allow those that cannot afford market rents to get space and make provision within the Wenlock priority office area, providing an additional 1.5% of such floor space can only be a benefit. As Mr Callum accepted, compliance with LB29 um, was a policy in support of the proposal. Indeed, officers rightly found it was a significant benefit of the proposal in the officer's report 
and that must be right since the provision of affordable workspaces agreed to be a policy priority for the LPA. Secondly, it said the scheme fails to make a significant affordable housing contribution as sought by policy LP13. Well, however, the policy, as you've seen, Mum, says no such thing. It doesn't require a significant contribution. Rather, it requires the maximum reasonable amount of affordable housing subject to viability and site context. The LPA have specifically accepted the proposed affordable housing contribution of £157,823, which represents the maximum reasonable amount of affordable housing contribution that could be provided. Therefore, again, as Mr Callum accepted, the affordable housing contribution is therefore entirely compliant with the development plan policy, and this is a policy that's supportive of the grant of permission. The fact that the contribution is to an off-site affordable housing, a complaint of Mr Hodgson, is nothing to the point. Both the local plan and the London plan permit an off-site contribution in the circumstances that arise here on this employment-led proposal. Thirdly, a complaint is made that the scheme doesn't deliver 60% employment for floor space. Again, the utilisation of the word objectives, not the actual policy, but contrary to the objectives of policy LP27. And we say the phraseology yet again is important. Even within the reason of refusal, there's an implicit concession that the scheme complies with the actual wording. For a start, as Mr Stevenson explained, the new floor space is of a very high quality and there's the potential for provision of additional of above 54.2% provided, for example, through mezzanines. As such, no harm whatsoever arises from the quality of the provision. It's a clear benefit of the proposal. Part A of policy LP27 is therefore clearly complied with, and that's accepted by Mr Callum. There's also no dispute that Part B is complied with. Therefore, the only legitimate allegation of policy breach can relate to Part C. However, the 60% target in Part C, again, is expressly subject to viability. Officers agreed that the 54% employment floor space provided was the maximum economically viable amount of floor space on site, that any additional floor space would undermine the viability of the development. Neither the LPA nor Holborn Studios have advanced a different case to this inquiry. Mr Callum expressly confirmed that the conclusion reached in the planning officer's report was as valid now as it was then. Given that the scheme provides a maximum viable amount of employment floor space that could come forward, it does what is required by the policy. Again, Mr Callum accepted policy LP27 was complied with. In doing so, the scheme delivers on the ultimate objective of this policy and that of the opportunity area and the WENDOT priority office area by delivering an increase in employment floor space. Therefore, each of the free land uses brought forward at the site is expressly accepted by the LPA to be entirely policy compliant in their own right. These are the free uses that the development plan supports coming forward here in the quantum being delivered. There is no separate policy dealing with overall balance of uses and the suggestion that there may be harm in the round in those circumstances or that the free policy rights somehow leads to a wrong is entirely novel and unreasonable. A development cannot cause harm by entirely complying with relevant policies in an up-to-date development plan. So, Mum, can I then deal with the benefits? And we say there will be a range of significant planning benefits, both to the immediate area and to the borough if redevelopment is permitted. However, before turning to them, I've just got to take a moment to deal with the approach taken by the two planning witnesses that oppose the grant of consent. We say the approach taken by them was profoundly contrary to the usual approach and has resulted in them carrying out a fatally flawed planning balance. In assessing the impact of a proposal, it's necessary to look at both harmful and positive impacts and to weigh them against one another. However, the approach of Mr Callum was to double count. What he said were harmful impacts, weighing them both as a factor against granting planning permission in their own right, then also using those same factors produce the weight to be given to the positive impacts. For example, the supposedly harmful impacts on residential amenity were weighed by Mr Callum both as a harmful impact, but then also used as a factor to reduce the weight given to the provision of market housing. This plainly and can only lead to an entirely distorted and unequal planning balance, since the harmful impacts are weighed twice on both sides as what is meant to be a balance. Mr Hodgson's approach was even more flawed and inexplicable he sought to introduce into the planning vocabulary a new philosophical concept, you'll recall this, Mum, of pure, 
and uncompromised benefits. In this new Hodgson world, benefits only count if they're uncontaminated by any harm. However, this is effectively Mr. Callum's double counting, since the same harms are weighed separately in their own right, and then again when assessing the benefits, taken to an even more extreme position of using the harms to not only reduce the weight given to the benefits, but actually to eliminate them. It's again completely distorted since the harms are not also eliminated unless they are pure. Needless to say, that approach of Hodgson has no support in policy, guidance or, frankly, practice. And the consequences of those errors aren't just academic, because as Mr Callum accepted, the benefits of the proposal were significant in their own right. And therefore, adopting the correct approach, he should have, weighing the harm he identified against these significant benefits. Mr Hodgson's purity approach led him to the bizarre conclusion and you'll recall this, ma'am, it was noteworthy. Mr Hodgson, a serious planning consultant, apparently, takes the view that this proposal has no public benefits at all, meaning that, as he accepted, his planning balance was entirely academic because it could only lead to one conclusion. It also meant he could offer no help to you on the weight to be given to the various benefits of the proposal, and his evidence on weight and his overall balance can effectively be disregarded as being of no assistance. Therefore, the only witness to the inquiry who has properly weighed the benefits of the proposal is Mr Marks. And as he said, the benefits are considerable and include, firstly, the additional employment floor space that I already have mentioned, bringing about a net increase on the commercial floor space uh, that's provided on site and therefore it will deliver the priority policy objective for the Wenlock Priority Office area. We say the benefits should be given significant weight. Then the improved employment floor space the existing space is substandard. In the LPA's words, it's in need of modernisation, lacking in DDA compliance, has restricted layout and access arrangements, also highly energy efficient. The scheme would transform this deficient accommodation into high quality, contemporary and adaptable floor space, meeting the needs of modern commercial occupiers. Again, a benefit that should be given significant weight. Affordable floor space. No long-term requirement for Alban Studios to provide affordable workspace currently, but 11.5% of the proposed commercial floor space will be affordable workspace with rent secured in perpetuity at 60% of market rent. This excess above the policy requirement is recognised by the LBA to be a benefit of the proposals and again should be given significant weight. Housing delivery, 50 new homes in a sustainable location enabling the LPA to sustain its housing land supply. Housing delivery in Hackney has historically been poor. Over the last five years, only 86% of Hackney's housing requirements have been delivered. The council only achieved 77% in its HDT results published in December, representing a 19% drop. Therefore, there remains a pressing need for all forms of housing. And considering the government's imperative to boost the supply of housing, this benefit should be given substantial weight. Design. We say the scheme is well designed and is the product of positive engagement, both with the LPA and its design review panel. It's common ground with the LPA that development reflects local design policies and government guidance on design. And we say it should be given significant weight in accordance with Para 139A of the MPPF. Environmental scheme provides 100% biodiversity net gain, which well exceeds the 10% in the Environment Act 2021, which of course is now as well, it is now in law, but I think, well, I won't speak for no, but I think the fact is we say it's, it's academic because it's 100% in this case, on a site with currently very limited biodiversity opportunities. New landscape communal gardens would be provided together with a pedestrian link towards the Regent's Canal significant weight to that benefit. Economic, as I've said, 529 jobs, an increase from 52 on site, additional economic bon benefits from indirect employment and resident spend, and it will ensure the long-term future use of the site for employment purposes, therefore benefiting the vitality and viability of the priority office area. And again, in accordance with Para 81, benefit must be given significant weight. Ms Mr Parkinson has told you about the net heritage benefits and finally, the sustainable PDL development, which says substantial weight in the MPPF. Therefore, across the board, ma'am, doing an audit across the three dimensions of sustainable development, we say the scheme will result in a significant improvement over the existing situation.
Can we just penultimately, before we finish, so just ask you to consider the consequences if you refuse this ap appeal. We say the buildings, the consequences of a refusal would be profound. The buildings on site are coming to an end of their natural, physical and economic life. They are old and tired. It is agreed they require modernisation and upgrading. The site's not DDA compliant. The buildings don't make efficient use of the site. It's agreed with the LPA that there's a restricted layout currently and access arrangements. Further, based on anticipated EPC changes by 2030, all the buildings will require significant improvements in order to meet those standards. The status quo, as I've said previously, cannot continue. Maintaining the current position would frustrate the aspirations of the development plan and condemn the future of the site to continued uncertainty and debate. The only credible future for this site is redevelopment has been consistently recognised by the LPA throughout this inquiry. It is rightly common ground with the LPA that the cost of upgrading the floor space for a wider occupation within use class EGI would not be economically viable. Therefore, if the scheme is refused, not only will many significant benefits be lost, but the site will remain as underutilised and wasted resource within the priority office area contrary, we say, to the aspirations of the council and the government. So, Mum, can I close with the overall planning balance that faces you? As the LPA have consistently recognised before now, the balance is overwhelmingly in favour of the grant of permission for this sustainable development. We say all the evidence that the inquiry demonstrates that the scheme complies with all re relevant development plan policies read as a whole. Indeed, it's noteworthy that neither Mr Callum nor Mr Hodgson carried out a proper assessment of the compliance of the scheme against the development plan as a whole, including the policies that even on their own case were complied with. Their assessment of compliance focused only on the policies said to be breached. There are 15 policies not considered in any detail on the evidence of Mr Callum and Mr Hodgson, which is supportive of the proposal to which there now must be added the three policies referred to in the reason of refusal for. And Mum, just to help you, we've listed the development plan policies at the very back in Appendix 1. I won't take it to you, but you've got Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. Indeed, Mr Callum agreed that the development was supported by very significant elements of the development plan, and there were a number of policies which support the development. Therefore, a balanced assessment of compliance with the development plan as a whole can only be made by considering the support these policies give to the proposal. And as we've said, both Mr Callum and Mr Hodgson failed to do this, and their assessment of development plan compliance was therefore materially deficient. Indeed, after being taken through the development plan policies in support of the proposal, Mr Callum accepted that to be contrary to the plan, very significant weight would need to be given to that conflict with the policies and the reason of refusal. For the reasons we've set out, there is in fact no conflict with those policies, but in any event, it cannot sensibly be said that there is very substantial conflict. As such, we contend and submit the scheme benefits in the Section 38.6 presumption in favour of the development, which accords with the development plan. It should also be approved without delay under Power 11C of the MPPL. Therefore, planning permission should be granted unless other material considerations indicate otherwise. And the other material considerations in this case do not indicate a decision other than in accordance with the development plan. As Power 208 of the MPPF is not engaged because balancing the heritage arms against its benefits, the scheme does not cause any harm to designated heritage assets. Indeed, as you've heard, the scheme delivers a suite of very significant benefits which demonstrably outweigh even the harm alleged to be caused by the other parties. Therefore, even if it is concluded that the scheme is not in accordance with the development plan or that Power 208 of the MPPF is engaged, those benefits clearly outweigh that non-compliance. Therefore, Mum, in closing and in conclusion, Mr Parkinson and I ask you on behalf of the appellant to allow the appeal respectfully and therefore grant planning permission. And Mum, unless I can help you any further, those are the closing submissions of the appellant. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr White and Mr Parkinson. OK, then. Um, now half past one sorry it's not it's um uh, 1344 any other matters that we need to deal with well i think that leads me therefore to i have all the information that i require 
which is, is quite unusual at the end of it, an inquiry, but I've got everything here. Um, thank you very much, everyone. I will therefore formally close this inquiry um, and thank everybody who um, has contributed and those uh, who are listening online. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, madam. Thank you.